And we are recording. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today, February 8th, 2024, for Decentralized Identity and Interoperability, Connecting Credo with Hyperledger Bezu, Cardano, Checked, Hyperledger, and Oncreds, and OpenID Connect for verifiable credentials. I'd really like to thank everyone for joining us today. And most importantly, I'd love to thank our three presenters, Alexander, Renata, and Artem. Um, they are amazing members of our community. They've been contributors for a very long time to uh, Hyperledger, but especially the identity projects at Hyperledger. I got to work with Alex five or six years ago, and, and that's been a, that was a great experience. Um, I am going to really quickly take you through a couple of slides as an intro, and then we're going to jump into the presentation. Okay, I don't know why you're doing that. All right, um, share screen. All right. Um, really quickly before we start, um, we have the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. Um, and this applies to all meetings at the Linux Foundation, working groups, special interest groups, workshops such as this. If you have any questions about these matters, please contact your company counsel. Or if you're a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew Updegrub of the firm Gesmer Updegrub LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. And also is with all Hyperledger meetings. This is under the Hyperledger uh, Code of Conduct. Um, the best way to sum this up is be excellent to each other, but we do have the Code of Conduct documented, and that's going to be in the links that I'm going to share um, once we get started. Um, but really quickly about Hyperledger, we are the open source global ecosystem for enterprise-grade blockchain technologies. Hosted by the Linux Foundation, we have a number of graduated incubating and labs projects. These are just a sample, um, but Anoncreds, Aries, Bezu um, are really the, you know, some of the internal, some of the Hyperledger projects are going to be highlighted today, but we also have some non-Hyperledger projects. That's what makes this presentation so exciting. But identity is an ecosystem. There are a lot of different organizations involved, and we're going to, this team is going to talk about them during the presentation. Um, you mentioned Hyperledger a second ago. There's the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which hosts the DIDCOM Working Group, the Interoperability Working Group, SideTree, Identifiers and Discovery Working Group. There's Trust Over IP, which is really focused on that governance layer, but the Good Health Pass, the Trust Over IP uh, layer model, and then multiple working groups underneath that. There's the Open Wallet Foundation, which is just about to turn one years old, um, which hosts Credo, which is one of the technologies going to be used today, which we're pretty excited about. Multiple SD Jot projects, the Safe Wallet Special Interest Group, the Architecture SIG, the Credential Format Comparison SIG, which is doing some great work, um, as well as the OpenID Connect for VCs Due Diligence SIG. Then you've got the W3C, which is where a lot of this work started years ago um, with the W3C Credentials Community, the DID Core Specification, and the Credential Format. And, and we're really excited that that's going to get a mention shortly. And then OpenID. OpenID Connect for Verifiable Credentials is a really nice part of this presentation, one of the bridges that we're really excited to see being built uh, through all this interoperability work in the identity space. Um, but open source only works with you um, using the products, learning about the products, contributing to the projects, um, which would be fantastic, and helping to maintain them as, as you go along your contributor journey, um, but also advocating for the projects. We cannot exist without the help of our community. Um, that's why we say we, we host these projects, but also the communities that build them. Um, one of the reasons to engage, well, you want to keep up with the community project. You want to provide use cases that help the projects better serve your needs. If you've got a really interesting healthcare and decentralized identity use case, and you're the only one who knows about it, well, maybe the community is not going to be building the things that you need to make to bring that to life. That's why you want to engage. Easier help with issues. Um, one of my favorite things about this community is we have an incredibly active um, Discord, and it is fantastic. And the, the signal to noise ratio is generally great. And we have really great contributors who, you know, they have day jobs. Middle of their day, they're stopping to answer a question from someone who's stuck in a really thorny problem or is trying to get through a getting started guide. And that's something that we're super proud of. Our community is very open and welcoming. Um, and it's not just to contribute to the projects. You want to you know, include feedback as well. And it's not just developers. You can engage in UX. You can engage in documentation. We need project managers on these projects. Anything you can bring to the table, um, the Linux Foundation, and more importantly, Hyperledger, and the projects themselves really count on that. Um, how we communicate as just Hyperledger and the different projects 
we say every project's different, but we have a bunch of tools that are in common. Discord, email lists, SIGs and special interest groups and project calls, as well as Discord, as well as um, GitHub itself. Um, GitHub is sort of the, the center point for, all, for each of our projects. And there's a lot of communication that happens there as well. And then what to expect from the community. Um, we've mentioned the antitrust policy a moment ago. We mentioned the code of conduct. We record all of our meetings um, and, and we take notes and put them into our wiki. Um, I mentioned GitHub a second ago. I should probably add the, the wiki to here as well. Um, and then the last slide for me, before I turn it over to our fantastic presenters, what to expect from today. Um, we're gonna have a workshop with great knowledgeable presenters who've been working in the space for a very long time. An informative presentation that I think you're gonna get a lot out of, particularly in the context of how important interoperability is, not just to identity, but just to the DLT space itself. A fantastic demo, which I'm looking forward to seeing. And then we're gonna get hands-on using the service Gitpod. Um, we're going to put some links in the chat shortly. Uh, you need to connect your Gitpod account to your, um, yeah. So AM, thank you for putting that note in the chat. I'll answer that in a second. You, you need to connect your GitHub account to Gitpod to be able to get hands-on. But once you do, you're basically getting a development environment with everything pre-installed. You're not going to, we're not going to, and you know, stop the workshop at an hour and a half to give folks an hour to install applications. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, this is not being live streamed. So this, this slide is slightly a lie. It is being, however, recorded to YouTube. Um, it will be on the Hyperledger YouTube. I'm also going to embed the video in the wiki page. Uh, the wiki page is going to include the recording, the notes and the links that I'm gonna share momentarily. There's gonna be a thank you note, which will go out probably next Monday to everyone who registered. If you didn't register, that's fine. All the links are gonna be in the YouTube, uh, the YouTube video description, as well as on the wiki page and Gitpod. Um, if on Sunday you want to go back and refer to the video, you can go back into the Gitpod link and, and play with the environment. Um, so we're pretty excited to experiment with that. With that, I am going to turn it over to Alexander, Renata, and Artem. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and let them share their screen and let them introduce themselves and kick us off. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for the great introduction. Uh, uh, share my screen. Can you see it? You look good and you sound good. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we are really looking forward and uh, hoping to hoping that this presentation will be uh, interesting, uh, useful for those who are new in this identity space for those who are not new there still can be some uh good things in order to summarize the knowledge in order to uh specifically uh, talk about the topic of interoperability so uh just a couple of words about uh what we want what we want to achieve with this presentation why we are doing it uh actually there is a number of uh myths about self serving identity maybe some misconceptions. And one of the goals is to demystify it and uh, provide actually more context about what is self sovereign identity, what is the state of interoperability in self sovereign identity. And the first thing that I wanted to start with, that uh, self sovereign identity or decentralized identity, is it is not a framework. It's not a tool or a library, right? A society is a concept. It's a model for uh, digital identity. And uh, there are multiple specifications, protocols uh, in social identity. There are multiple frameworks, uh, tools, libraries, APIs implementing these uh, principles and protocols, right? So it can look like a bit a mess, but uh, one of the goals of this presentation is actually to show that it's not as complicated as it seems. And, uh, there are very good trends in the community uh, kind of to stabilize these protocols, to converge them. Uh, and interoperability, probably for someone, it can be surprised that it has now a much better interoperability than it maybe used to be before. So uh, the first goal is uh, to summarize uh, the main approaches, specifications, profiles in uh, SSI. So before we start talking about interoperability, we need to kind of 
define what is SSI and what are the points in SSI uh, where interoperability may happen, occurs. And the second goal is actually to show this uh, interoperability between uh, some of the approaches, tools, and uh, frameworks. So uh, as Sean already mentioned, our uh, presentation today will consist of uh, three main parts. Uh, the first part is a presentation, the theoretical part. The second one is a demo. And the last one is a hands-on session where everyone will have a chance to uh, maybe write some code to do something uh, in your environment, or more precisely in Gitpod environment to simplify the uh, prerequisites and installation and can just feel how it all works. Uh, the first part, the theoretical part, will consist of three sections. Uh, the first one, just a brief overview, uh, definition of what is also an identity. Uh, for those who are new, just to understand what we are talking about, and for those who already uh, know about it, just to remind and maybe also summarize some of the core uh, principles. The second part, uh, before we actually move to the demo in interoperability, it's important to define uh, the dynamic points, uh, the variable points or interoperability variables. Uh, sometimes it's called profiles. Uh, and in particular, to discuss uh, different uh, formats of verifiable credentials, different exchange protocols, uh, different DID methods, verifiable data registries. Uh, and uh, in the third part of the theoretical, uh, third section of the theoretical part, uh, we are going actually to discuss the exact values of interoperability variables that we are going to show in the demo and the hands-on part. So in particular, uh, we are going to provide a short overview of the Credo or x framework JavaScript framework. Uh, we are going to talk a bit about uh, the Hyperledger Uncreds and W3C verifiable credential formats. Uh, we are going to provide an overview of Hyperledger areas and uh, OpenID for verifiable credentials. And in terms of the verifiable data registries, which is quite often uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology, uh, we're going to talk and then show in the demo such uh, frameworks as Cardano, Checked, uh, Hyperledger Bezo as part of the Ledger Indie Bezo initiative. So uh, about us, about the speakers. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Alexander, and uh, I'm a head of uh, Decentralized Systems uh, Department at uh, DSR uh, Corporation. And uh, I've been working with uh, uh, open stores with the uh, cell storing identity, the centralized identity technologies, as well as uh, with the uh, distributed ledger technologies and blockchains, uh, consensus protocols for uh, many, many years. Uh, and in particular, I have a lot of experience in contributing and maintaining uh, such projects as Hyperledger Indie Areas, uh, Ursa, Unicred, uh, and so on. And uh, I will present the first uh, part, the theoretical part, uh, the presentation, and the demo and hands-on parts will be driven by uh, Renata Tar. Uh, she's a lead software engineer at this our corporation. She also has uh, many, many years of experience working with uh, open source, uh, self storing identity, blockchains, distributed ledgers, and such projects as Hyperledger Indy areas, the check, and so on. And also we have uh, Artem with us on the call, uh, and he also can be ready to help uh, with the questions in chat uh, or anything that may arise during the hands-on. Uh, just a couple of words. So, uh, you know, we both represent uh, DSR Corporation, just some background uh, why we are providing this uh, presentation, because actually in DSR we have a lot of experience of working with uh, blockchain and cell server identity uh, technologies and contributed to many, many uh, open source projects, uh, which includes in particular many identity uh, frameworks, projects like India, Research, uh, Sorry, Nanocrats, Checked. And also we are the members of Hyperledger Foundation, Open Wallet, the first over IP. So uh, kind of one of the main uh, organizations uh, which uh, adopt and uh, advance uh, the centralized identity. So uh, let's move to the presentation uh, part. And uh, the first uh, thing uh, that we need to understand is what is actually self-serving identity? 
And uh, let's start with uh, uh, three models of uh, digital identity. So the first model, it's probably a traditional model, a centralized uh, model where uh, an identity and the attributes uh, associated with the identity are usually uh, controlled by third party organizations, uh, which actually means that there is a different representation of the user or in every organization. Uh, from UX point of view, it means that usually uh, people have to create a new account with a new password uh, for every uh, service. And it's not perfect, of course, from the security point of view, from the privacy point of view, because uh, people don't have any control of the information about them. Also, it's not so convenient for, and uh, secure from the UX point of view. It may lead to lots of passwords that needs to be managed. Many of them uh, may leak. Uh, and so on. The second model is a federated identity. That's a model when uh, the information about identity, the attributes are encapsulated in uh, uh, identity uh, providers. Uh, and uh, the third party organizations uh, can leverage the identity providers to uh, be authorized to access uh, this data. Uh, just some, some examples uh, that can be associated with this model are OAuth or OpenID Connect protocols. Uh, from the UX point of view, uh, it may look like when people go to the website, there can be buttons to log in with Facebook or Google or Apple or GitHub, whatever. And uh, UX is much better. Of course, US, UX is much better. Uh, but in terms of privacy, it's still... Uh, there is still no control by the identity owners uh, of the data, how it's used, uh, how it's processed, and so on. And, uh, uh, and finally, we have a third model, self sovereign identity or uh, decentralized identity. And uh, unlike other models, uh, this is a model which is focused on privacy. And it actually enables, uh, enables uh, uh, the Holders, holders of the identity to maintain a full control of the identity or the attributes associated by the identity. So it doesn't require intermediaries to uh, provide the necessary data. So identity is fully managed by the holders and uh, presented, disclosed uh, to the corresponding services uh, when needed. So it's more privacy preserving, it's more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication uh, and uh, also, it sometimes it leverages uh, the blockchain or distributed ledger technologies. But as we will see later, it's uh, actually more abstract than these, and it's not mandatory. So another uh, representation of a non-SSI versus SSI uh, approaches. In non-SSI approaches on the left side, you can see that information about us, it's uh, really uh, distributed, uh, the internet. So lots of uh, presentations, lots of pieces of identity uh, in many, many services around the net and no control by the user. So it's more close to the Web2 approach when actually organizations uh, leverage uh, the information about, uh, about the users. Uh, and on the right side, the holder, the uh, actual controller, owner of the identity is at the top. Uh, it's in the center. Uh, and it's more close to the Web3 approach where uh, the control is returned back to the users. There is no need in, uh, in, in uh, mediators uh, between the users and uh, the final service. So uh, before we uh, consider an actual example of what it means, actually, how it's achieved, uh, because right now it's just some words, right? Uh, but before we move to this, uh, let's consider two very important uh, concepts uh, associated with the uh, self certain identity. Uh, the first one is verifiable credentials, and the second one is uh, decentralized identifiers or uh, DIDs. Uh, both of these uh, concepts are not just concepts, it's actually uh, standards. Uh, as part of W3C, it's a uh, recommended uh, standard. And let's start with the concept of uh, verifiable uh, credentials. Now, first of all, a credential uh, is a set of one or more claims uh, made by an issuer. So let's consider, for example, a digital ID, digital passport. Uh, 
right? And there can be some claims like a name, surname, uh, address, uh, date of birth, uh, and so on. Just some mapping, some claims, some keys, some values, right? What is verifiable credential? Actually, verifiable credential is a temper evident credential, which means there is a claim and some signature, for example, digital signature, uh, which can be verified. So that uh, when the user presents this digital passport, it's possible to actually check that it's uh, authorized, that it's issued by the government or uh, corresponding authorities. Uh, so yeah, that's what about verifiable credentials. And uh, the second concept is uh, DID, the centralized identifiers. So uh, basically, the centralized identifier can refer to any subject, like a person, organization, thing, abstract entity. And uh, unlike traditional uh, identifiers, it can be decoupled from any centralized registries, identity providers, certificate authorities. What is important here? What is important here? So we have an identifier, but also we have uh, a DID document uh, which contains some kind of metadata, some data associated with this uh, subject and identifier. For example, in DID document, we may have uh, some service endpoints. We may have some keys, some keys like public keys, uh, which can be used for uh, authentication, which can be used for the proof of ownership, proof of possession of this identifier, which can be used to assert to do any assertions, uh, key agreement and so on. So it's, it's very important that it's identifier plus the keys and other metadata in form of uh, DID document about the DID subject. And also uh, previously we mentioned that the ID is decoupled from any centralized registries. And actually, uh, if you look at the syntax of uh, DID, it consists of did, uh, then did methods and did method specific string. And the did method, it's actually what uh, defines how exactly uh, the idea is processed in terms of uh, CRUD operations, where it can be resolved. And here we have the concept of verifiable data registry, uh, verifiable data registry. So this is uh, like an abstraction. Uh, it's an abstraction, uh, can be a database, can be a blockchain, distributed ledger, uh, where, for example, the deed documents uh, can be published and can be resolved. Like in a simple way, we can have a ledger and where for every DID, we have a DID document published as a ledger and anyone can read it, right? Uh, and uh, can actually get information about, for example, a public keys associated with this uh, DID. The number of methods, it's quite significant. It's more than 100 different uh, methods for various approaches, various uh, blockchains, ledgers. Some of them don't use a uh, ledger at all. We will see it in a sec. Um, so on this slide, we have an example of a DID document. A DID document, you can see it has, it may have some services, for example, like service endpoints, uh, URLs, uh, which can be used to access uh, the DID subject. And also we have verification methods, uh, which are basically, uh, which is basically an array of uh, public keys in different types, different formats can be used. And these keys, uh, as I mentioned, that can be used for authentication, for to prove the ownership of this DID, for assertion, uh, key agreement, and so on, various purposes. Okay. So uh, we just considered the concept of verifiable credential, like some claim with authorship, with signature, and a DID, some identifier with the corresponding keys. Now let's uh, uh, put two of these concepts together and uh, consider them uh, in action to actually understand uh, the, how SSI works, what is the main SSI workflow. In SSI, in SSI, we usually consider a three-actor model. So we have an issuer, a holder, and a verifier. So issuer is the, an entity it can be an organization, it can be a user uh, uh, who actually issues a verifiable credential. A verifiable credential is issued by the issuer uh, and it's sent to the holder. And it is a holder who 
actually manages the credential, who stores this credential, uh, usually in some wallet. It can be a mobile wallet, it can be some cloud-based hybrid wallets. So that, that's one of the first differences between traditional non-SSI approaches and SSI approaches. The SSI, the data, the identity data in form of verifiable credentials is stored on the holder side, not in some identity providers, not in the blockchain, never, but on the holder side. Then uh, the right side, uh, whenever uh, the holder needs to access some service, uh, the service as a verifier can request, uh, can request some proof and the holder can present this uh, information derived from the uh, verifiable credential. And the verifier, since uh, the verifiable credential is not just the claims, they also contain signature from the issuer. The verifier can check, can verify the signature and uh, make an attestation that uh, requested uh, parameters, requirements are satisfied. So here we have a verifiable data registry. So uh, why it's needed? Uh, so we just discussed uh, and considered the verifiable credentials. The issuer issues verifiable credentials, it's sent to the holder, and then holder presents this credential to a verifier. Uh, the DIDs, it's also important here because uh, in, order to, uh, in order to sign a credential, some keys are needed, right? And uh, we remember that DID is not just identifier, it's identifier plus some keys plus some metadata in DID doc. So the issuer usually has a DID, it's called DID1 here, uh, and the verifiable credential is actually signed, signed by the keys associated with this DID1. Okay, and this DID1 and the corresponding keys, which were used for uh, signing, they can be published to verifiable data registry. So what it means that the verifier, when, when presentation comes to the verifier, verifier can see this is a presentation for a credential issued by an issuer with DID1, and they can go to, to the corresponding verifiable data registry. Uh, how it can be done is defined by the DID method. And uh, they can actually resolve the DID, they can get a DID document, they can get uh, the public keys and verify the signature from the issuer. Okay, that's uh, why DIDs are convenient uh, here because they can actually, actually decouple uh, these keys as identifiers from any centralized things and make all these things very uh, decentralized. Also, by the way, what is important here, that verifier doesn't need to communicate with the issuer uh, directly. You can see that uh, this resolve, uh, resolve once, uh, resolving is done uh, via verifiable data registries in a decentralized way. So it's good in terms of correlation, privacy, the issuer doesn't know when the credential was used by the holder, when it was presented by the holder. And also the issuer can be just, the service may go down, there is, no dependencies on the issuer service uh, in the process of verification. Okay, and the last uh, part here, you can see D2 associated with the holder. So uh, depending on different SSI uh, frameworks, specifications, uh, this part can be a bit different, but essentially, essentially, usually verifiable credentials are usually uh, issued for some holders, DAD, for some subjects, DAD. D2 in this case. Uh, and of course, the issuer signs not just the claims, but also the fact that it's issued for D2. Uh, and uh, uh, why it's also uh, card can be used during the presentation, during the presentation, the holder can actually uh, can actually prove that he owns this DID2 by uh, presenting the corresponding proof of ownership, the signature associated with the DID2. Right. So usually on the verifier side, we may have uh, two signatures, one by the issuer, initial with the DID2, initial uh, signing of the verifiable credential, and the second one uh, from the holder uh, made by D2, and it kind of establishes an ownership uh, of this presentation uh, of the corresponding keys by the holder, which means that it's actually uh, the entity for whom the credential was issued, uh, this entity is going to present it. Uh, so we have DID1 for the issuer, DID2 for the holder, we have verifiable credential signed by DID1, associated with DID2, and on the verifier side, 
the presentation comes usually with two signatures, one by deed one from the issuer, the second by deed two uh, from the holder. Usually, uh, deed two doesn't need to be put uh, on the blockchain. In many cases, some uh, off-ledger approaches for DAD are used, something like deed key, deed peer, some forms of deed ion, or deed carry, and so on. So it's not doesn't always mean that a DAD must be published on the ledger, no. There are some approaches, some methods, DAD methods, uh, which doesn't require it, and it's can be quite good for the common people, for holders, because they don't need to put some data to to uh, blockchain, which can be good from, for example, GDPR compliant uh, purposes. Okay, so uh, the next in the structure. Uh, sorry, any questions? No, Alex, go ahead. That was an artifact. You're good. Okay. So uh, the next uh, the next uh, slide it's uh, about uh, trust or IP stack. Uh, we have seen that trust or IP it's one of the organizations advanced in social identity technologies, and uh, one of the main uh, one of the main uh, uh, outputs of the working groups is the creation of trust or IP stack. Which has a very nice, very nice uh, layered representation of the concept uh, identities, and let's try to actually map up what we just discussed uh, to this uh, stack. So let's start with the left part. It's like a technology stack, and uh, on layer four, on layer four, we have actually the application ecosystems. It's where we uh, apply uh, uh, apply social identity, decentralized identity. What uh, use cases that can be like supply chain or healthcare or you know education, banking, whatever. Uh, on the layer three, we have uh, some protocols, actually some trust task protocols. And uh, the credential exchange protocols that we just discussed where the issuer issues verifiable credentials and the holder presents uh, approved to the verifier. It's uh, one of the examples of these protocols. Of course, there are more protocols than just that. There can be some protocols to establish the connection, uh, some protocols for discovery, uh, a number of them. And uh, the next question is, OK, right now we just discussed that the credential is somehow uh, somehow was sent uh, from the issuer to the holder, and then holder somehow presented it to verifier. But how exactly? What, is, what are the channels? What is a transport? What is a communication? And actually, we go to layer two. It's like a peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, layer, right? So on this layer, uh, two entities, for example, issuer and holder, holder or verifier, or just some abstract agents, uh, they establish a connection, a peer-to-peer -peer connection, peer-to-peer -peer channel between them. And uh, the information, for example, the uh, state machine of the protocol, the verifiable credentials, the proofs, they can be exchanged uh, via this channel. Okay. Uh, and uh, usually one of the approaches for this channel is a DITCOM, DIT communication approach, where this channel is created. There is a, uh, all information is encrypted, leveraging the keys associated with DAD. With DADs. It's also a very convenient and powerful uh, way, which is also transport agnostic. Right, and uh, on layer one, we have public utilities. That's where we have, uh, where we have the verifiable data registries, where we have edit methods. Uh, it can be some databases, blockchains, or other ways to resolve uh, the DIDs to get the keys, uh, and so on. So you can see, uh, like the protocols on layer three, three, uh, some state machine is executed, and the messages are communicated via some peer-to-peer -peer communication channel on layer two. And on layer one, we have like the blockchain, the ledgers, we have that the registry abstractions and so on. Okay, it's about the technology stack. And also important part of trust over IP stack is a governance stack. Uh, on, on every layer, there can be a separate governance which defi defines the actors, the roles, uh, the framework, the uh, corresponding certifications, just an example why it's needed. Uh, so we understood that the verifiable credential is issued by an issuer, and then the holder presents it to the verifier. But the question, uh, why verifier should 
actually trust that it's a valid credential issued by the issuer. Yes, we can verify the signature, we can verify the crypto part, but it can be that the holder just signed the, this credential on his own. Uh, that's why we need some trust framework. That's why we need to actually understand that this particular DID, for example, this particular key, which was used to sign a credential, it can be trusted. It can be associated with the government authority entities, right? So the verifier can check that, yeah, it's a credential uh, associated with the corresponding credential definitions, the, uh, decentralized identifiers, which are actually owned, controlled by the government. That's just one of the examples why we need some additional governance. And uh, it's not only about this, it's of course also about like uh, the frameworks, uh, the wallets, uh, which can be used, uh, can be certified and so on. Okay, uh, and uh, the last uh, slide in this uh, part, it's uh, just to emphasize the relationship between cell server identity and the blockchain, because one of the myths is that uh, the society cannot be done without a blockchain or that the blockchain is a very essential part of SSI. Uh, the answer is no. Blockchain part is optional in SSI cases. Blockchain may appear only on layer one, still layer three, layer two. We haven't seen any blockchains there, any ledgers. On layer one, we may see uh, as an example of verifiable data registry. Uh, it's actually quite popular uh, situation when uh, blockchain is used, uh, distributed ledger is used as a verifiable data registry because it's actually a very good option in many cases, especially to publish the issuers, issuers public key. Previously, we discussed that it's good in terms of trust, in terms of decentralization, in terms of uh, there is no need to verify to access the issuer uh, infrastructure. So it's a very reasonable option in many cases to use verifiable data register. But again, it's not mandatory. Also, it's important to understand uh, important to understand how exactly uh, the ledgers, uh, the blockchains are used. What is usually stored on the blockchain? Uh, issuers, DID, the document, public keys. Again, it's, it's just uh, pure public information, right? No private data. Revocation registries. Uh, Revocation, it's quite important part of SSI because in many situations uh, we, need to, we may need to revoke uh, a credential. For example, consider a driver license. By obvious reasons, it can be revoked sometimes. Uh, and credential schemas, it's also quite a popular case uh, when credential schemas defining what exactly we can expect in a credential. This information, public information, can be part of the ledger. For example, like what uh, the fields in the digital passport, like name, address, uh, and so on, can be there, what are the format, the attributes, and so on. Then, what may be optionally stored on the blockchain? It's Holders, DIDs, and public keys. Uh, previously, we discussed that the refiable credentials are usually associated with some DID uh, from the holder, subject's DID, uh, right? Uh, and uh, in some situations, uh, it can be okay to publish these DIDs of holders, uh, public keys. So the blockchain, although although in most of the cases it's not needed, and Morava is even maybe not desirable because blockchains are immutable. And uh, in terms of GDPR, in terms of some uh, regulation laws uh, for common citizens, uh, it may be better to use some DAD methods, alternatives, which don't require publishing data on the blockchain. And it works just fine. Again, SSI doesn't require to leverage to use blockchain in all these cases. And also, what is important? What is never ever stored on the blockchain? The verifiable credentials. The verifiable credentials are never put on the blockchain. The keys uh, which, which were used to sign the credentials could be put, but the verifiable credential itself, it's always stored on the holder side, some wallets. And of course, private keys, private keys as well, they're never put on the blockchain. Okay. So uh, we are done with the OU uh, part, and uh, let's consider the next part before we actually jump into interoperability. Let's uh, consider so-called interoperability variables or profiles 
it's actually the points, uh, the points which we need to define uh, before talking about interoperability. It's the points and nodes in SSI kind of approaches where these uh, variables uh, may appear. Uh, and let's look actually, let's use the trust or IP model uh, as an example. We have three layers, exchange, uh, credential exchange, uh, communication and public utilities like VDRs. And uh, if you start thinking about uh, kind of verifiable credentials and this uh, three actor model, uh, we may realize that usually we need to answer at least, at least three questions. What? Uh, what is the verifiable credential format? Like, so what exactly we are exchanging here when we say that issuer issues and sends verifiable credential to, to the holder? But what is the format? What, what is verifiable credential, right? Right now, it's just some abstraction, and that can be multiple kind of ways to represent, a, for example, a digital passport, right? In terms of encoding, in terms of signatures, in terms of uh, semantics, uh, and so on. The next question, okay, let's assume we, de we defined the format of verifiable credential, but how exactly is transferred from the issuer to the holder, from the holder to verifier? What is the exchange protocols? And uh, also multiple options uh, can be there. And the third one is where? It's about DID methods and uh, VDRs. We already uh, discussed it can be multiple DID methods, so do we need to use a blockchain, a ledger, or we need to use some existing uh, trust within uh, domain names, or we should make it off ledger, some centralized databases. So how, where exactly these uh, public keys, this DID and DIT methods uh, are stored? Uh, so we can see just some examples here that in terms of formats, it can be hyperledger unencrypted, it can be W3C verifiable credentials in either JSON LD, JOT, or SDJOT formats, it can be a mobile driver licenses, and so on. It's, of course, it's not a full list, it's just some, some examples, some popular uh, options. Exchange protocols, it can be hyperledger areas, DITCOM based, it can be uh, uh, if uh, also did com based formats it can be uh, open identity for verifiable, open ID uh, for verifiable credentials, it can be W3C, uh, verifiable credentials AP or CHAPI, it can be formats defined uh, by mobile driver license, uh, ISO st uh, standards. And uh, where? So uh, we're going to consider a number of options. Uh, there can be like some self resolving options, which doesn't require any other. Uh, storages, it's did key is an example. Uh, there can be some DNS based uh, resolving via the web. Uh, and there can be some ledger specific things like uh, Indy, did Indy did soft, checked, for example, checked, uh, Cardano, did Prism, uh, Bezu, Indy Bezu, and so on. And uh, the combination of these variables, not actually only these variables, they can be more variables defined. It's just, I would say, I would say the core ones, uh, the combination of these and other variables is sometimes called a profile, sometimes called a profile. And as an example of more variables, we can define the approaches for revocation, for uh, trust, uh, and so on. So uh, let's start uh, thinking about these variables and uh, the very first, uh, the very first uh, combination of variables that was part of Hyperledger and one of the very first production ready frameworks uh, approaches for uh, SSI. Uh, it uh, wasn't still associated with the Hyperledger Indy and later with Hyperledger Areas and Unencrats, which means that Hyperledger Unencrats is used as a verifiable credentials format. Hyperledger Areas, the com based approaches, are used as Exchange protocol and Hyperledger in the ledger, uh, permissioned uh, ledger is used as a VDR. And it's, well, one of the profiles reason about has its cons and pros as any other profile. Uh, but what is important here uh, that there are much more options. There are much more options and profiles than just this. And especially for people who may start their journey in uh, the centralized identity world, if they start the journey with some particular organization or framework, let's say at Indy 
or mobile driver licenses or open id uh they may think that like this framework is the only way to implement SSI, which is not, which is not. You can see that there can be multiple different uh, options. And uh, even in uh, hyperledger areas, even in hyperledger areas uh, and like Credo framework, which was also part of hyperledger areas uh, some time ago, uh, we can see that much more Variables and formats are supported, not just Anoncrats and Darius and Indy, like the standard Indy based one. Even as part of hyperledger areas, uh, we can see support for both Anoncrats and WSC. We can see support for areas for OpenID, uh, for refiable credential uh, protocols. We can see support uh, for many, many different uh, types, uh, DID methods, ledgers, blockchains. Uh, that Actually, we what we are going to see today during the demo and presentation part. And uh, just a couple of more uh, details a bit about different uh, variables. Let's start uh, with what, with the verifiable credentials format uh, to see the difference. Uh, before, before we uh, start discussing this difference, uh, it's important to, it's important to uh, understand what is selective disclosure and the uh, predicate, right? So let's assume we have a credential, like can be passport, digital ID, with some claims uh, about a subject, a holder. Uh, selective disclosure means that during the presentation of this credential to the verifier, uh, only subset of the claims can be disclosed. For example, just a nickname, and uh, some information about the age is uh, presented, is disclosed. And uh, for example, address is uh, still hidden. It's not uh, it's not provided to verifier. But just of course, this uh, feature is very good in terms of privacy, in terms of uh, being unlinkable. Uh, so it's it's a very very nice uh, feature. And the second feature is uh, predicate predicates. Uh, one of the options is actually to disclose the attributes as is, but uh, another option is uh, to use predicates and uh, disclose, for example, not the exact age, but a predicate that age is over 18 or 21 or whatever. It's also very uh, strong. It's a very powerful privacy preserving uh, feature. And uh, what is important that depending on the verifiable credential format, uh, some formats has support uh, of selective disclosure and predicate, some formats uh, don't have it. Uh, what is also important uh, when we discuss these different uh, formats, we don't say that like one format is better or worse uh, than another. Verifiable credential format or exchange protocols, uh, they all have their own cons and pros, and depending on the context, depending on the interoperability requirements, uh, one or the other uh, format can be a right uh, selection, right? So let's just briefly consider uh, probably the most popular ones and the difference between them. The first uh, four, uh, the first four formats, uh, they are part of uh, W3C verifiable credential. That's actually the most popular, the most common, uh, standardization of a verifiable credential uh, format uh, in form of a JSON or JSON-LD. So as serialization, uh, the first two we use JSON-LD and the second uh, is just JOT, just obviously JSON. Uh, what LD means, uh, it uh, uh, provides some linked data capabilities to just a pure JSON, which means that there is some semantics, some schema, some meaning uh, in the JSON fields, uh, which can be a very, very nice uh, feature in some cases. Uh, the difference between these uh, formats is not only in serialization, but also in the proof format and signing algorithms uh, used. Uh, the first one is just uh, JSON standard uh, JSON-LD. Uh, usually some common standard uh, Signatures are used in form of data integrity proofs. It can be like a CDCA, a little curve uh, signatures can be RSA, can be a DDCA, lower origin ID to 5.5.9 uh, signatures. It JSON-LD is encoded. 
It doesn't support selective disclosure, doesn't support pretty case as like any common standard signatures, they don't support it. The second type is JSON-LD with uh, BBS plus type of data integrity proofs. BBS plus, it's a more advanced uh, type of uh, signature which supports selective disclosure, which supports uh, selective disclosure. The third one is a uh, dot. Uh, it's like in the first one, it usually uses some common uh, signatures like a CDCA, RSA, DDCA, uh, JSON as a serialization type, and it's uh, actually a valid, a common uh, dot leveraging JWS, GA, and a uh, whole family of uh, standards, uh, which is, can be a nice option uh, if dot is already part of any system and you leveraging uh, JOT uh, to represent verifiable credentials can be a reasonable option. And uh, like any common DOTs, it doesn't support selective disclosure, neither selective disclosure nor uh, the predicate. And uh, the fourth format that we are going to discuss as part of a level 3C family, uh, it's a SD JOT, it's selective disclosure JOT. It's actually an extension, an extension of uh, JWT JOT standard to support selective disclosure, to support selective disclosure, which means that uh, it's issued uh, leveraging some hashes and not all the values can be disclosed uh, to the verifier. It's a very nice, very nice extension, which is uh, more privacy preserving than common JOT. And still it's a valid, uh, valid uh, token, which can be used in the same cases where uh, JWT is used. Okay, so that's about like uh, some popular popular combinations for of verifiable credential format uh, as part of WFTC. But WFTC verifiable credential is not the only standard. It's not the only format. Hyperledger, Unencred, uh, most commonly used in India and areas. It's another very popular. Standards been adopted, been in production for many many years. Uh, right now, it's has its own specification definition. It's part of Hyperledger Anuncrats project. Uh, you can see that it's the most privacy preserving standard because it supports both selective disclosure and predicates. It also has other very nice features because it's based on zero knowledge proof uh, cryptography. It's of course much more advanced, and complex. Uh, cryptography based on CL, Kamenich Lysenska uh, signatures. JSON is used as a serialization. Uh, I'd like to note that as part of the uh, recent uh, BCGAF uh, opportunity, uh, right now it's possible to represent the Hyperledger Uncred verifiable credentials in uh, W3C, SW3C verifiable credentials or verifiable presentations. So uh, I hope that it's actually a very uh, big step forward, the convergence and interoperability and uh, uh, should be possible actually to leverage the existing Hyperledger Unencred credentials where, for example, W3C verifiable format uh, is expected. So it's not as separate now as it may look like. And uh, the last popular option as part of verifiable credential, it mobile driver license, which Maybe it's not uh, always considered as a verifiable credentials, but it is by essence. Uh, it's driven by ISO uh, format, and it's actually already part of uh, many frameworks to write mobile applications uh, for Android, for iOS. Uh, and it's based on a binary serialization format, CBOR and uh, COSEC responding types of signatures, the CDC8, so the recommended uh, way sign uh, recommended signature there. Uh, although the signature is uh, like a common one, it's somehow similar to SDGVT because it also supports uh, selective disclosure. It also supports selective disclosure, not providing all, not disclosing all the information in the mobile driver license, but uh, it's possible to disclose only part of this uh, data. Okay, so that's uh, what about verifiable credential formats. Now let's look at the how part. It's about verifiable credential exchange uh, protocols. Uh, and uh, the first one here, it's uh, open ID for uh, verifiable credentials, uh, which actually consists of three main standards. Uh, 
verifiable uh, open ID for verifiable credentials uh, issuance presentation uh, presentations and also a self issued open ID uh, provider v2 we are going to discuss it in more details a bit later uh, what is important now that uh, it can work uh, with any verifiable credential format right so also it's one of misconception that it can work only, for example, with W3C JSON-LD credentials. No, it's possible to leverage these uh, standard exchange protocols for mobile driver licenses or for anonymous or for jobs. It's really uh, format agnostic. Transport, it's not only HTTP, but there are some work in progress uh, specifications to use it our Bluetooth and some offline scenarios. So yeah, it's a very promising. Uh, it's a very promising uh, set of uh, standard specifications being adopted on some government levels, and uh, yeah, can be a good option, especially if OpenID or OAuth are re already used uh, within uh, the product. The second, the second uh, type of credential exchange protocols, it's DITCOM based and Happy Ledger areas or DIF uh, Lucky are two uh, well-known examples here, especially Happy Ledger areas. Uh, in terms of refinable credential format, it also can work with any format. So it's not like it's uh, linked or restricted only to Hyperledger Anomcrats. Although, of course, traditionally in most of the implementations, in most of the frameworks, it's used with the uh, Hyperledger uh, Anomcrats as part of Indie areas. Also, no restrictions in transport, right? JITCOM is designed in a way that it's transport agnostic, that it can work over uh, HTTP, Bluetooth, NFC, whatever. So essentially, it supports both offline and online scenarios. Uh, the next type is the mobile driver license protocols. Uh, well, these protocols, of course, they were designed specifically for mobile driver licenses as part of ISO. Uh, and as for transport, it's uh, quite versatile. It can work our NFC, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, HTTPS, supporting both offline and online scenario, scenarios. Uh, the next uh, thing is a uh, W3C credential handler uh, API or uh, CHAPI, it's like browser uh, specific uh, thing. And also, W3C uh, 3C has uh, a verifiable credential API, which is basically a REST uh, API to uh, process verifiable credential, to issue, verify, present, store them. So it can also be a nice uh, option to achieve interoperability, uh, interoperability uh, in SSI and verifiable credential-based workflows. Okay, it was the second thing about how. And uh, finally, about uh, where. Uh, where, what kind of deep methods uh, and corresponding verifiable data registries uh, we can use. As I mentioned before, uh, there are more than 100 different deep methods. Uh, you can find them in this link. Uh, I'll just mention some of them uh, with different uh, properties. Uh, DIT key, it's a self-resolving and ledger independent. What it actually means that as part of DIT identifier itself, we have a public key encoded. So once uh, once a receiver uh, has a, a DAD, DAD string to identify itself, uh, they can just uh, encode, uh, get the corresponding public key like DIT doc, right from uh, this DID screen. So it's obviously it doesn't require any ledgers, any databases, because, well, it's just self-resolving. DIT peer, it's a bit similar to DIT key. It's also ledger independent. It's partially self-resolving. It's a bit more advanced because it supports some uh, rotations, some more dynamic in a DID document. DIT web, it's an example of a DID, which also doesn't require a ledger doesn't require blockchain and it leverages existing uh, domains uh, reputation resolved through DNS. Can be an option for some scenarios where, yeah, makes sense to leverage existing web uh, trust. DIT web uh, it's a, a new extension of uh, DIT web, uh, which uses carry carry instead of DNS for trust. Uh, it tries to actually keep the nice properties and formats of uh, DIT web, uh, but at the same time, tries to solve uh, some centralization uh, and other issues uh, related to trust. DIT carry, uh, it's 
Gary it by itself, it's quite interesting uh, approach to uh, SSI, also one of the another set of uh, corresponding specifications, uh, standards, and implementations. And it carries a ledger agnostic uh, VDR. It's famous that it's ledger agnostic. Uh, did ION, uh, did ION, uh, in this uh, DID method, uh, DIDs are resolved through blockchain agnostic side tree protocol on top of Bitcoin. There are some variations of side tree protocols on top of other uh, layer one uh, blockchains like Ethereum. Also, did ION has a self resolving option similar to did key. So, for example, if it's a holder uh, where we don't probably want to publish the DID on the ledger, we can use a self-resolving option for DIDION. If it's an issuer, uh, maybe it makes sense to use a full uh, version of DIDION, uh, which uh, is resolved against uh, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, or some layer one uh, blockchain. Uh, did the entity Sorin? It's a uh, well-known DIT method uh, as part of Hyperledger family, which are associated with Indy Ledger and DIT Sovereign in particular with the Sovereign deployment, which is the most famous, the most uh, well, one of the uh, oldest deployments of uh, Indy. Uh, DIT Ethereum, it's a self-managed it's approach for self-managed uh, DIDs uh, resolved on Ethereum as a VDR. It also has very nice uh, properties in terms of gas savings since it's a permissionless uh, blockchain. And also uh, it uh, has a nice uh, properties to be self-verifying. Uh, it checked, so checked, it's a very nice uh, option uh, for a permissionless uh, uh, ledger for SSI use cases supported in multiple formats. Uh, it's based on Cosmos SDK and uh, as a result, it's part of the Cosmos uh, uh, Internet of Blockchains uh, family. So uh, it's you can see that uh, all of these methods are very different. Some of them use blockchains, some of them don't use blockchains, some of them use permissioned ledgers, some of them use uh, permissionless uh, ledgers. So there is a big variety of uh, approaches there. Okay, uh, and uh, as mentioned before, uh, Sometimes uh, the combinations of these uh, variables and other variables uh, is called a profile. Uh, also, would like to know that the notion of a profile is not like uh, just fully established uh, definition across various organizations and working groups. Uh, and not all the profiles have formal specifications. Some of them, uh, some of them uh, uh, have, but uh, many are just kind of uh, essentially a combination which are just used in practice. Uh, there is a nice link as part of Open Wallet Foundation. Uh, there is a working group uh, which has a very nice uh, spreadsheet uh, uh, compilation of various profiles and properties and variables. Uh, I would like just to mention a couple of uh, profiles. Uh, high Assurance Interoperability Profile. It is an example of a profile with a formal specification, which has a formal specification. It's based on OpenID for verifiable credentials, on uh, selected disclosure jots as a verifiable credentials. And uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't require usage of DAD, so it's usually just based on some row keys or well-known uh, extension. The second uh, profile, which is also standardized, which also has a formal specification, is Decentralized Identity Interop Profile. It's also based on OpenID for verifiable credentials. It's uh, based on JOT verifiable credentials. And it assumes this one, uh, comparing to the first one, uh, it assumes usage of DADs like DITWAP, DIT, uh, JWK. Uh, I saw uh, M uh, Mobile Driver Licenses, uh, MDL. We have seen previously that they have their own set of uh, standards for the format of the mobile driver license for the exchange protocols. And of course, uh, Hyperledger, Indy, Anoncrat, which usually it's a very popular combination uh, in many areas frameworks, in many production deployments and uh, services. Uh, they use Hyperledger Anoncrat as a verifiable credential format. They use Hyperledger areas as Exchange protocol, and they can use Hyperledger Indy, get Indy or itself as uh, a ledger, as a ledger. Okay, so 
uh, we just discussed kind of the uh, interoperable uh, points. And uh, before we move to the, actually the demo part, let's uh, consider what are exact values of these interoperable variables we are going to show uh, today uh, during the demo and hands-on uh, parts. So for the demo parts, uh, part, uh, we are going to have four, uh, four uh, demos. The first one is uh, Anoncrats and Cardano, which uh, shows the usage of Hyperledger Anoncrats, Hyperledger Anoncrats uh, with uh, uh, Cardano as uh, a VDR. Cardano as a VDR and Hyperledger Areas as exchange protocol. The second one is Anoncrats plus check. Uh, there we also have a Hyperledger Anoncrats, verifiable credential type, and checked uh, as uh, Anoncrats VDR and uh, DAD uh, VDR using did checked method. The third one is also with checked, but in this case, we are going to uh, see that it can be compatible with W3C verifiable credential. So W3C verifiable credential, JSON-LD with uh, ED25599 uh, signature and uh, checked as a VDR. RS again is an exchange protocol. And the fourth one, it's a W3C VC and open ID for verifiable credential. Uh, there, unlike the previous examples, we are going to see that open ID for verifiable credential uh, specification is used as the verifiable credential exchange protocol. W3C verifiable credential as a format, and uh, for simplicity, it uses DIT key as a most simple uh, DIT method. So you can see uh, some level of uh, interoperability. Uh, and even if you're talking about hyperledger frameworks, it's not just you know indie. Uh, or Anoncrats, uh, different combinations that Anoncrats can work with Cardano, Anoncrats can work with Check. Uh, also, uh, they can work with uh, Anoncrats, they can work with WCC verifiable credentials, uh, OpenID uh, also for verifiable credentials, also very interesting case. So it's about the demo part. So uh, unfortunately, it's or fortunately, it won't be interactive. So you will just see uh, the demo provided by Renata. And the third part will be the hands-on part. Uh, it's uh, where you'll have a chance to actually write uh, some code and run some demo uh, on your own. And uh, this part will be devoted to a new uh, initiative uh, in the Bazo initiative. And uh, it's a nice initiative, not only to show that this initiative just exists, but also to show the interoperability between uh, Hyperledger Areas, uh, Anoncrats, W3C, and Hyperledger Bezo, another very well-known uh, framework, uh, distributed ledger uh, from Hyperledger family. So it would also be quite interesting. OK, in terms of the, of the frameworks that we are going to use for the demo and for the uh, hands-on parts. Uh, hey, hey, our demo and hands Can I interrupt you for one second? Before we dive into the demo scenarios, do we want to see if there are any questions left in chat? Uh, I have one. Oh, and it seems like the person deleted their question. So um, let me just check here. If you do have a question, please leave in chat. Can you speak a little bit about anonymity and privacy and the challenges with the various credential format types? Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, sure. Well, uh, actually I can answer it now. Maybe I can answer it a bit later because uh, actually we are going to uh, we are not jumping to the demo right now right away. Uh, we are going actually also to describe some of these things in a bit more detail. So maybe no, let no, me answer it. the question in like 10, 15 minutes. Go for it. Uh, yeah. So uh, in terms of the frameworks, in terms of the frameworks that we are going to uh, use, uh, we are going to use Credo. Uh, some of you may remember it by the name of Ares uh, Framework JavaScript. Uh, at the end of last year, it was moved from Ares, from Hyperledger Ares to Open Wallet Foundation. Uh, and it was uh, renamed, uh, first of all, it was renamed to Agent Framework, Framework JavaScript, but now the latest brand, uh, the latest name is uh, Credo. And the Credo, it uh, implements uh, both Anoncrats and Refiable Credentials. Uh, W3C refiable credentials, as 
PC formats. Uh, it also implements, uh, of course, Happy Ledger areas. That's uh, one of the essential parts of Happy Ledger areas family, which it was. And also, Credo has support for OpenID for verifiable credentials. And in terms of VDR uh, for Cardano, we are going to use uh, AFJ. Uh, I still call it AFJ because it was AFJ extension at that time uh, from uh, Roots ID, uh, which uses Cardano as testnet and uses Cardano as a registry for non -creds. Also, we are going to use uh, uh, AFJ uh, module. It's just part of the uh, Credo AFJ uh, main uh, repository. Uh, it's possible to leverage checked, and we are going to use testnet, of course, of checked uh, for the demo. Uh, and uh, we are going to use an indie Bezu. It will be a local setup in Docker, uh, an instance of Happy Ledger Bezu, the corresponding smart contracts uh, for the hands on uh, part. And uh, there is actually also an AFJ extension, uh, an AFJ extension uh, which uh, provides this uh, functionality, integrates the Indie Bezo into Credo or uh, AFJ. Okay, and uh, before we jump to the questions, maybe the next couple of slides also can answer some of the questions. Uh, some more details about the formats and frameworks that uh, we are going to touch on the demo. Uh, Credo, Credo, uh, RS framework JavaScript, as I mentioned, uh, it was moved to Open Wallet uh, Foundation. Uh, it's a framework based on JavaScript TypeScript, and uh, it can be used either as a backend web server, .js, or it can be used in mobile applications, uh, for example, React Native. And, uh, another uh, Happy Ledger Areas framework, Areas Bifold, Areas Agent uh, React Native, is based on uh, Credo, based on Areas framework JavaScript. So uh, Credo provides an SDK API to be integrated into web or mobile applications. And also there are some extensions. Uh, the framework is pluggable when there is a number of extensions. Uh, there are some extensions providing REST API on top of it. So uh, Credo used to be one of Hyperledger Area's projects uh, since uh, uh, 2019. And it was moved to Open Wallet Foundation at the end of last year and renamed uh, to Credo. Uh, in terms of kind of the main components, uh, functional parts, uh, it has a wallet. Uh, there are options for the wallet, uh, Indie SDK wallet and Area's Hyperledger Area's uh, SCAR. Uh, right now, the India-based uh, wallet is being deprecated. So, as far as I know, the next uh, release is going to Arias Oscar would be the main, uh, the only option. Uh, verifiable credential formats, Hyperledger Anoncrats is supported. W3C verifiable credentials like JSON-LD, uh, JOT are supported. Selected disclosure GVT is supported, and uh, also there are extensions for BBS Plus. Exchange protocols, areas, uh, V1, V2, and open ID for fiber credentials. The last one, it's uh, kind of work in progress, but there are already some uh, functionality available and we're going to show it today. Uh, and DIT methods, uh, traditionally, uh, of course, Indie, Ledger, DIT Indie, DIT Soft are supported, but also DIT Key, DIT Peer, and DIT Checked, uh, integration with the Checked Ledger, it's part of the core framework, it's part of the core framework. And also there's a number of extensions, uh, different DIT methods for uh, resolving, for re registering, uh, and uh, options for unencreds. And in particular, Cardano, uh, we're going to leverage one of this extension to show uh, the support of Cardano blockchain uh, as an option of PDR in Credo. Okay, so, uh, then about the next frameworks uh, that we are going to look at, uh, verifiable credential format, Hyperledger Anoncred, Hyperledger Anoncred. Uh, right now it's a separate Hyperledger uh, project and there is a specification, there is a specification and there is also uh, an, a reference implementation uh, in Rust, Anoncred's Rust. Uh, as a format, as a verifiable credential format, uh, Anoncred uh, now as to be the most privacy preserving format because it supports predicates, selective disclosure, uh, zero knowledge proof properties, anonymous revocation, and so on. And uh, 
the main adoption historically it's uh, hyperledger indie hyperledger areas uh, and also it's important uh, to know because many people wondering why it's so different from WSBC Republic Potential. Why it doesn't use this format from the very beginning? And the answer to this question because it was implemented, it adopted before W3C Refiable Credential Standard was uh, actually finalized. Uh, right now, there is there is a way, uh, thanks to BCGov, uh, this opportunity, there is a way to represent uh, Hyperledger unencrypted credentials in as W3C verifiable credentials. So this gap, it's uh, almost closed, but still. Uh, Hyperledger unencrypted, uh, they have a custom format based on JSON. Uh, they have zero knowledge proof based signatures, uh, CL, Kamenich Lysenska unencrypted signatures. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, recent uh, W3C representation support. So I think it's quite important milestone. And um, it will be maybe important for the demo part. Uh, if we need to work with the Hyperledger Unicreds, usually uh, we will need to publish a number of entities, a number of entities to a VDR, such as a ledger, such as Indie Ledger or other ledger. Uh, the three main entities, the first one is Credential Schema. The first one is Credential Schema. Uh, schema defines uh, what uh, are the fields in the credential in the claim. For example, if it's a passport, it can be like the name, surname, address, and so on. The second is credential definition, which is basically a public key, the issuer's public key. Uh, the signature, since it's based on zero-knowledge proof, it's a bit non-standard. Uh, yeah, that's why it's like a specific format for this uh, public key and credential definition representation. So credential definition, or for simplicity, you can consider it just as an issuer public key. And the third part, uh, I think we won't look at it at the demo, but uh, usually if you need a revocation, uh, the revocation registry, also set of keys, set of corresponding uh, data for accumulators, it's also usually published uh, to a VDR, to a ledger. Uh, just a slide about the history of Uncreds, I think it's just uh, quite interesting. So initially, initially, Hyperledger Uncreds was just part of a Hyperledger Indie, and it's uh, in production since the Sovereign Mainnet is launched in 2017. So it's like almost seven years. Uh, and it was part of the Indie Crypto. It was a separate project, implementing uh, Uncreds and other things required for Indie, uh, and it was adopted as part of Indie SDK and Indie Ledger. Then in 2018, uh, a dedicated uh, Hyperledger Ursa project was established. So it was considered to be as uh, a common place for uh, crypto as part of Hyperledger. It's replaced uh, Indie Crypto and uh, CL Unencred, uh, um implementations, implementation of these zero knowledge proofs uh, were moved there. Uh, right now, Hyperledger Ursa is deprecated, but yeah, there is a number of other dedicated uh, repositories in Hyperledger which are still implement this, provide this uh, functionality. And in 2019, uh, the Hyperledger ARS uh, appeared. Uh, it initially mostly used in the many many of these frameworks used in the SDK and uh, in the Ledger, and uh, as a result of this, uh, Hyperledger Anonymous. Uh, and in 2022, the Hyperledger Anonymous separate project appeared. So uh, the goal of this project was to actually create a specification of Anonymous, uh, very uh, detailed uh, standard specification, and also have a ledger agnostic uh, implementation of Anonymous independent of Indy, independent of areas, uh, and the good results of uh, this standardization we are going to see on the demo. Well, because of this, we can use Unencreds not only with Indy, but also with Cardano, with Checked, and any other le uh, ledger uh, which implements the corresponding uh, interfaces. So that's kind of a history of evol uh, evolution of uh, Hyperledger Unencreds. OK, uh, the second form format that we are going to see during the demo uh, demo presentation uh, part, it's uh, like the most well-known, the common W3C verifiable credential. Uh, 
There is a current uh, model uh, version one, which is the recommendation since 2022. And there is the working draft for model version two. Uh, as a serialization, it uses JSON and JSON-LD with linked data, context, and semantic. For proof formats, it can be either uh, data integrity proofs, which are can be considered more or less like common standard uh, signatures, uh, or uh, JOTS, uh, JWT format, uh, JWS, uh, standard is leveraged. And as I mentioned before, uh, SD selective disclosure JOT, which actually extends uh, the JOT to provide some nice uh, privacy features in terms of selective disclosure. Uh, crypto signatures, it can support BBS Plus, uh, as more advanced selective disclosure supported cryptography, or it can use uh, some standard traditional uh, schemas for signatures like ECDCA, DT curve, uh, RSA, EDDC, and so on. Just an example how how a verifiable credential can be presented uh, as a W3C JSON-LD uh, format with data integrity proof and uh, ED25509 uh, signature. On the left uh, side, it's a verifiable credential. And on the right side, it's a verifiable presentation. A verifiable credential is what is issued and signed by the issuer and stored on the holder side. And verifiable presentation, it's what is derived from the credential and shared with the verifier, with the verifier, what is presented for verification. Uh, so what is important here, since it's JSON-LD, it has a context, which introduces some semantics, some meaning uh, for the fields. It contains uh, an ID of the credential issuer. This example, this one, 49, it's a DID of the issuer. And uh, we can resolve this DID and find uh, the corresponding public keys, which were used to sign this verifiable credentials. So that's actually what the verifier does. Uh, we have the uh, claims about the subject of the holder, uh, like ID and some name, for example. Name, contract number, it can be address, whatever. Uh, and you can see this ID, it's uh, the uh, DID2, if you remember it in the very first example that I uh, gave at the beginning of presentation. Uh, it's uh, actually the DID of the holder, the ID of the holder. And of course, the proof, it's uh, just a signature made by the issuer. It's made by the issuer. You can see the verification method. It's a method uh, from the issuer's uh, DID. It's a signature by the issuer. Now let's look at the verifiable uh, presentation, uh, what it has. It has the verifiable credential. Kind of, we can, say, uh, we can assume almost as is, as on the left side. Uh, so the verifier can see the issuer who issued the credential and it's the, the DID also of the holder of the subject of the credential. Uh, since uh, it has a verifiable credential, it obviously has uh, a proof uh, signature from the issuer signature from the issuer here. And also, in addition to this, uh, it has a signature uh, by the holder, by the holder. It's kind of proof of key possession, proof of ownership, right? We're kind of making sure that uh, the credential issued for this particular DID for this holder, it, the uh, presenter actually has access to the corresponding private key, has access to the, to the corresponding private key and can create the signature. Usually uh, during issuance, the uh, issuer may also ask uh, the holder to prove the ownership of this DID so that the issuer can make sure that the credential is issued to the right to the correct uh, owner of this identifier of this DID. So that's uh, that's a standard representation, some examples. OK, uh, the next. Uh, part is exchange uh, protocol uh, that one of the protocols that we are going to use and see during the demo is hyperledger areas. Uh, and what is important, uh, also one of the myths that hyperledger areas is some particular framework like Recapy or AFJ or as framework Go. And well, of course, it's true. All these uh, great projects are part of hyperledger areas. But what is important, areas is also a set of RFCs, a set of uh, protocol specifications, which kind of define these protocols and uh, uh, multiple frameworks, they can implement these protocols. The very same protocols can be implemented by areas VCX, 
Ecopy, AFJ, and so on. Of course, there are also tools for interoperability. And uh, if you look at these protocols, these RFCs, uh, they are DITCOM based. Uh, but it means that DITCOM uh, is a secure uh, private communication methodology built atop the decentralized design of DA. So usually it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer communication, transport agnostic, can be run against any on top of any transport. And it establishes a secure channel, a connection between uh, two agents, for example, two wallets, uh, each of these wallets may have a DID, like did one, did two, uh, the corresponding keys. And these keys are used uh, for uh, encryption, to encrypt uh, the data, to encrypt the data. Sometimes it can also uh, sign the data if some non-repudiation properties are needed. Uh, and the protocols, they can be run on top of this secure channel, on top of this DITCOM. Uh, DITCOM, there are two versions, V1 and V2. Uh, V1 was uh, developing as part of uh, Hyperledger areas, Hyperledger areas RFCs. DITCOM V2 uh, is being developed as part of uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation, Decentralized Identity Foundation, but it's also uh, being implemented and leveraged by many Hyperledger areas frameworks as well. And uh, so, yeah, DITCOM is kind of a channel, uh, channel. Uh, communication methodology, methodology. And uh, on top of DITCOM, we can run any uh, protocols or state machines. DITCOM.org website, you can uh, look at it and it contains a list of various uh, protocols. And uh, one of the main, uh, most important and well-known protocols which are run on top of DITCOM are refiable credential exchange protocols. So, uh, like exchanging issuing credentials and presentation of credentials, it can be formalized as a protocol. But uh, actually any other custom protocols can be implemented like any state machine. And on this website, you can see other examples, not only related to refiable credentials. Uh, there can be even a composition of protocols. For example, an exchange protocol can be just part of some interaction where a credential needs to be issued or presented, but there can be a higher level higher level uh, logic, uh, which may be implemented as a state machine. For example, a game or, uh, I don't know, almost many things in the real world can be represented as a protocol. So uh, it was about like the Hyperledger areas, uh, part, DITCOM, exchange protocols. And uh, yeah, one more thing about Hyperledger areas. Uh, it's areas interop uh, profile. As I mentioned before, it's very important in areas. It's not just some random framework unrelated. Uh, we, uh, areas actually cares about interoperability quite a lot between uh, the implementations of the protocols. There are some tools, some test frameworks, uh, suits uh, to uh, make sure that it, it is there. And there are uh, profiles, kind of a combinations of areas, protocols, areas, RFCs which needs to be implemented to satisfy this interop profile. Currently, there is a V1 and V2 uh, profiles. Uh, as part of V1, the goal was to be able to establish connections, like connection protocol uh, as part of DITCOM, uh, exchange credentials and presentations via connections, like issuance and presentation protocols, and also be able to complete a connectionless uh, proof request, proof trans uh, transactions. Uh, as part of V2, V2 is more advanced. Uh, it has improved UX. It allows to reuse existing connections uh, out of band protocol. Uh, it uh, improves how connections are established, uh, improves how the issuance and presentation are done, uh, and the other things like multiple ledger types, multiple refiable credentials format, and so on. OK. Uh, so it was about Hyperledger areas. Uh, then about uh, the next uh, change protocol that we are going to look at, the demo, it is uh, open ID for uh, refiable credential. It is an open ID for refiable credential. So first of all, let's just consider a high level difference between the common open ID connect and OAuth and uh, open ID for refiable credentials. So uh, in the Common usual uh, open ID connect uh, protocols. Uh, we have like uh, the issuer or like some identity providers which uh, provide the information about the user's identity. 
the verifier. You can see this arrow. Uh, so it's actually the protocol that's for uh, authorization, OAuth, or authentication, OpenID on top of it, uh, where the holder authorizes the verifier to access information on her behalf via some identity providers. But uh, OpenID for verifiable credentials, they support self storing identity uh, credential exchange where there is no more this error, this communication between the issuer and verifier and the holder, the holder can actually provide uh, their credentials uh, on their own. So it's actually closer to the concept of self-issued uh, identity providers. Because if we have a verifiable credential on the holder side, then the holder it can also be considered as an identity provider. There is no need for any mediators anymore. But still, other kind of many other properties of the uh, protocol can be uh, can, can still be there, and OAuth or, or OpenID Connect uh, can still be a basis for this exchange uh, information. So um, just uh, let's look at these three main uh, uh, standards as part of OpenID for a refiable credentials. The first one is uh, what is needed for authentication is self-issued identity uh, provider. Uh, and it defines how the holders can authenticate in a self-sovereign way without any actor. So uh, they can issue a special type of token. Uh, no need to communication with any external parties, no need to communication with the issuers. So in this case, uh, the self-issued uh, provider is the holder itself. And usually these protocols can work together with the presentation protocol. It defines uh, some mechanisms uh, to on top of uh, self-issued uh, provider uh, to allow the presentations of claims in terms of uh, verifiable credentials. So the first approach we just defined that it's possible to leverage uh, the holder itself to present some information. And uh, the second thing it's uh, actually leveraging the verifiable credentials to uh, present them. There are multiple uh, options uh, for this uh, protocol it can be like a uh, same device or it can be a uh, cross device. Uh, the workflow can be, the UX of course can be a bit different, but yeah, essentially uh, it's the same protocol which works on top of OAuth or OpenID Connect. And uh, uh, the second, the third protocol here, the second group uh, for issuance, it's OpenID for refiable credential uh, issuance. And it defines uh, a way, an API, and uh, based on OAuth and uh, corresponding uh, endpoints, uh, which can be used to issue every verifiable credentials. Uh, there are also multiple uh, options in this uh, protocol with a pre-authorized uh, code or without it, depending that if uh, it's the wallet uh, initiates the issuance or it's the issuer, for example, website initiates the issuer, uh, it can lead to different uh, UI UX, for example, just a QR code is scanned or the issuance is done from the wallet, is started from the wallet. And uh, of course, uh, some steps in the protocol can be different, but uh, essentially, yeah, it's still uh, OAuth based protocol uh, where uh, Nexus token is uh, received and can be used to actually receive the credentials. And also, again, I would like to emphasize that it doesn't. Uh, bound is not restricted to any particular type format of refiable credentials. So any refiable credential format can be issued or presented uh, with uh, these uh, protocols. Okay, uh, and finally, let's consider the uh, last uh, set of variables. Uh, it's a verifiable data registry, it's where uh, variable. Uh, and we are going to see in the demo uh, three uh, three main uh, options for VDR. Well, not main, but the three options that we are going to show today. Uh, it's Cardano, it's Checked, and uh, it's a Hyperledger Bezo as part of Indie Bezo initiative. Uh, let's start with the Cardano. Cardano, it's a public uh, permissionless uh, blockchain. It's quite popular uh, blockchain. It was one of the first 
uh, ledgers uh, which implemented and adopted a proof of stake consensus protocol, of course, much earlier than, for example, Ethereum moved to uh, proof of stake. Uh, some of the properties of this blockchain that it's peer reviewed and has uh, verifiable uh, security. Uh, it can be used in different applications for smart contracts, uh, decentralized application, DeFi, DAO, NFTs, and SSI. And they have a main net since 2017. So it's quite well established and popular uh, option for a permissionless blockchain. Uh, as for Cardano and SSI, uh, we are going to base our demo on uh, IFJ extension uh, to use Cardano as an unencrypted registry to publish schema and credential definition. So we're going to show the interoperability between Cardano, uh, Credo, XFJ, and Hyperledger unencrypted. Uh, and it was uh, uh, based on the work uh, by Roots ID, this extension, this plugin. I also would like to mention that uh, uh, there is uh, also a project which is part of now Hyperledger Labs. Uh, it used to be called Atela Prism. Now it's open source. This uh, Hyperledger Labs is open enterprise agent, uh, which is also one of the frameworks implementing SSI principles and having integration with Cardano. Uh, in terms of uh, the standards, that will receive refinable credentials, uh, which is also what is uh, present in Open Enterprise Agent and Hyperledger Unencrats as part of Credo and to being supported in Open Enterprise Agent. Uh, the, second, uh, the second VDR, the second ledger blockchain that we are going to look at today, it's checked. It's uh, checked. It's a public uh, permissionless blockchain. Uh, it's based on Cosmos, uh, Cosmos SDK and Tendermint. Now it's common BFT. BFT. Uh, it's a, a pub application specific blockchain. There's any blockchain uh, written uh, using Cosmos SDK, which means it was created specifically for the centralized identity SSI uh, use cases. Uh, it also has a proof of stake uh, consensus protocol and the main net since uh, 2021. Uh, and it has some very nice uh, SSI features. Of course, it has its uh, own uh, DID method, uh, did check, define how to uh, resolve uh, the DIDs on the checked public permissionless blockchain. Uh, so also checked can be used not only for DID resolving, but ironcrats. Uh, it's an ironcrats registry. It supports hyperledger ironcrats, refinable credential format. So both W3C Refiable Credential and Hyperledger Unencrypts are uh, supported. A very nice feature is a DINT uh, linked uh, resources. It's possible to use check, a checked ledger to link any resources. Uh, for example, Unencrypts uh, entities can be also considered as such resources uh, with any DID, with any DID. And Universal Resolver uh, support. And uh, we are going to just use the package, uh, uh, checked package as part of uh, Credo, as part of Credo. So it's just essential part of uh, Credo or AFJ, uh, which is available right in the repository. It's just another good example of uh, interoperability between like Hyperledger, non-Hyperledger, open wallet, and so on. And uh, the last uh, uh, video that we are going to look at today, it's uh, Hyperledger uh, Bezo. It's Hyperledger Bezo. Uh, it, we are going to look at the Indie Bezo initiative, but before we move to Indie Bezo, uh, let me tell you a couple of words about Hyperledger Bezo. So uh, Hyperledger Bezo is a graduated active Hyperledger project since uh, 2020. Uh, it is Ethereum client written in Java, and uh, it can be used in two, uh, for two use cases. Uh, for public networks, such as the public Ethereum uh, networks, and for private permissioned networks, such as enterprise network or uh, supply chain ledgers. Depending on the approach, if it's public or, or private, uh, there are different, uh, different 
uh, internals, like different features, different consensus protocols. For example, uh, Bezos supports private transactions, which is very important for private cases. Uh, also, uh, it includes several consensus algorithms, several consensus algorithms. For public networks, it makes sense to use proof of stake uh, or proof of work previously, which used to be uh, leveraged by Ethereum. Uh, for uh, private permissioned cases, uh, some type of proof of authority consensus algorithm uh, is usually uh, used. For example, IBFT, QBFT, CLIC, uh, where IBFT is a recommended one right now. And proof of authority, it's uh, the consensus algorithm which actually uh, defines as part of permissioned network what nodes uh, can Form a validator role can be can participate in creation of new blocks. Unlike permissionless networks where anyone, almost anyone, can uh, run uh, a new node, a new uh, validator. So uh, what else? Uh, the business logic. The business logic uh, in Hyperledger Bezo is written uh, as smart contracts, as Solidity uh, Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, also, Bezo has a very pluggable architecture. Uh, and uh, just an examples of private permission, the uh, use cases where it can be used. The CBDC, it's a popular example, and Bezo is being adopted by a number of banks, uh, for example, in Brazil and Norway, to implement CBDC uh, solutions. The supply chain, as any permissioned network, uh, Bezo or Hyperledger Fabric, uh, they sub supply chain, it's a very natural use case. Uh, and the self serving identity, yes, we will see it can be a nice option for self serving identity because, uh, well, permissioned ledger is actually a valuable, uh, reasonable uh, option for uh, self serving identity use cases. Uh, in some cases, it may be okay to use a permissionless ledger if uh, dealing with the tokens and proof of stake is not a problem, but in many cases, and that actually that's why we have Indie Ledger, uh, public uh, permission the ledger is a better uh, option uh, because it can provide, it, it doesn't require uh, dealing with the tokens. Uh, it can provide more even trusted requirements, especially in government specific cases. So uh, Indie Bezo, Indie Bezo, uh, it's uh, uh, a new uh, initiative uh, which is currently uh, in progress. So uh, it's part of uh, Indy and there is a dedicated uh, repository, Indy Bezo uh, repository. Uh, it's a public permissioned ledger for SSI. So it's essentially the same as the current Indy, uh, Indy node. Uh, but unlike Indy node, it uses uh, Hyperledger Bezo for the blockchain part. Uh, just a bit of history. Uh, in the ledger, as you've seen, it uh, was created uh, like almost seven, eight years ago. Uh, and at that time, uh, there were no good options, production ready options for a public permission, the ledger, consensus protocol, and so on. That's why in the ledger contains not only the uh, business logic uh, required for SSI. Uh, like DAD, Simon Kratz, and so on. It also contains uh, the whole framework uh, for distributed ledger. It contains a custom implementation of a consensus protocol, RBFT consensus protocol, and so on, uh, which of course makes uh, maintenance of Indie Ledger, the code base, quite huge and the maintenance uh, non trivial. So the goal of Indie Bazo is actually to reduce this complexity significantly. And instead of uh, maintaining and supporting a custom consensus protocol, RBFT-based consensus protocol as part of Indie Plenum, we can leverage uh, another framework, which is specifically built and maintained uh, for these purposes. And Hyperledger Bezo is a nice, nice option here. So uh, in Indie Bezo, the whole bunch of Indie, like Indie Plenum is replaced. All the core blockchain part is replaced by Indie, uh, Hyperledger Bezo. And uh, SSI business logic instead to be like application specific and written in Python. Now it's uh, written in uh, Solidity uh, Ethereum smart contracts, which is quite compact way. It uh, has a good level of adoption. I mean, Solidity and so on. 
Uh, I'd like to note, of course, it's it's not an official repl replacement of PD. No, it's just an experimental uh, initiative. It's just an experimental uh, initiative. It's been uh, discussed, evaluated by the indie community. Because everyone is welcome to join. Uh, but yeah, we already have some uh, PUC, uh, an MVP that can be shown. So uh, what IndieBase also has, it has a client library, a VDR library. It has integration with Credo, a REST framework JavaScript that uh, we're going to see in a moment. Uh, in terms of uh, SSI features, uh, it has support for Unicrest, of course, Unicrest registry. Uh, and also it has support for W3C verifiable credentials. It's also a nice uh, extension. Uh, the old Indie Ledger uh, didn't work, uh, doesn't work with the up to date standard of W3C verifiable credential. So, IndieBazoo can do it. And in terms of DID methods, uh, right now, IndieBazoo has a support of DT Ethereum. It's like a standard method for Ethereum based uh, networks uh, with nice properties. And also there is work in progress uh, of a uh, separate methods. Previously, initially we called it Indie2. Uh, maybe we will rename it to IndieBazo. Uh, it's uh, maybe a method which will be a bit better in terms of migration of existing uh, data identifiers, in terms of permission networks and so on. And about like the history of this project, uh, this, uh, this initiative was proposed by DSR uh, at Indie Summit. Uh, in September last year. Uh, and in November, uh, we had the first uh, PUC for experiments, for discussion. So uh, this initiative is being discussed uh, by Indie community and the code is now moved to a separate Hyperledger Indie repository, Indie Bezel. And there is ongoing MVP work, uh, discussions and implementations uh, are continued. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> I think that's uh, enough, or even more than enough information before we jump to the demo part. And I think it's the right time for questions before we move to the demo. Awesome, thanks, Alex. Um, I will maybe work backwards on some of the questions that did not get answered. So Leonardo posted, is it possible to interoperate with authentic chain data containers, ACDCs, in verifiable credentials data model v2 uh mentions the cat the compatibility but you have vc exchange samples that use ac do you have vc exchange samples that use acdcs uh well uh, no as part of our today presentation we don't uh, we don't cover uh, acdc and carry based uh things uh so it's a bit out of scope uh right now yeah they use a bit different uh some uh Standards in some ways, but for example, did carry it's one of the DID methods which is compatible to DID method uh, specification. So even there, there is of course some level of interoperability. Uh, as for ACDC, I think it's a bit more challenging. Uh, but well, you see that uh, even in case of Unencrats and W3C verifiable credential, we already have examples and not just examples, the code, the working code. Uh, which can be used to represent Anoncrats uh, in W3C refiable credential. And for other methods, it's also not that complex to implement it if needed in some cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, Raganash asks, can you explain a little bit ZKP and Anoncreds? What are the entities involved? How are ZKPs, zero-knowledge proofs, generated and verified? Yeah, uh, I I will try to uh, just briefly explain it uh, because it's it's quite a complex quite a complex uh, topic, uh, but still. So, um, what is important there that uh, on the holder on the holder side uh, there is a concept of linked secret. It's not a usual standard private key, uh, but let's consider just some secret which actually links multiple uh, credentials together and li links these credentials to the holder. During issuance, uh, during the issuance, uh, this linked secret is uh, presented to the issuer in some blinded form, not as is. And uh, uh, the issuer issues a credential, like the claims itself and this blinded linked secret, uh, 
uh, in a specific form. Uh, the signature is quite complex. Uh, it's RSA, but currently it's RSA based uh, signature for the main uh, claim and uh, it's electric curve based uh, for revocation. For revocation, it's a separate signature. Uh, and then uh, what is the most interesting and important here? That when uh, the holder presents, uh, creates a verifiable presentation for the verifier based on hyperledger anoncrats, uh, the holder doesn't uh, disclose, present the credential as is. Unlike, for example, many cases in WCC, VC, where credential just sent to the verifier, verifier as is plus some data. There, uh, the presentation or proof to the verifier, it's a new entity. It's a new entity uh, derived from the credential and created by uh, the holder. And it's created depending on what fields needs to be disclosed and what uh, predicates needs to be proven. Based on this information requested by the verifier, the new entity proof, a new blob is created and sent to the verifier. So uh, verifier can check the corresponding uh, signatures. Uh, and uh, the verifier doesn't know doesn't know uh, too much. The verifier just knows what uh, they uh, requested, the disclosed attributes and the predicate. But uh, since uh, the signature is unique every time, the proof is unique every time, there is a nice uh, property which reduces to remove correlation, right? Because in a uh, traditional signature, the signature is always the same, right? So it's one of the ways for correlation. But there, the signature is unique. It's always a zero knowledge proof, right? kind of. Uh, non-interactive knowledge proof. Uh, that's why uh, it reduces a correlation. It's uh, more privacy preserving. So it's first of all uh, the support selective disclosure. We can disclose only part of the attribute. The second uh, predicates. We support predicates. The third, the signature is unique every time. That's why it's uh, very hard to link. This uh, in terms of the signature, it's impossible. Uh, and the fourth thing, uh, uh, revocation, it's a uh, really advanced uh, technology for revocation is used based on accumulators. It's also anonymous uh, so that uh, the verifier uh, doesn't uh, know. And even if you look at the ledger, we don't know what exact uh, uh, credentials are uh, revoked. So anonymous revocation is the, uh, the last thing. So uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, there is an uncreated pack and there is corresponding uh, uh, math, uh, mathematical uh, paper as part of uh, URSA uh, and the libraries, which kind of has all the necessary formulas and details how it works. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Uh, AAA has a question. What are the best points of research on key management? It might be out of scope but authentication threshold signatures and end user distributed storage backup, I expect is part of the landscape somehow. Uh, yes, it's also important. It's also quite important things that uh, can be part of any profiles which may define some standard ways. So uh, first of all, what is important that uh, the keys, uh, and especially we're talking about uh, the holder side uh, stored in the user uh, wallet which can be a mobile wallet or it can be some cloud wallets. And uh, uh, here there is also no just one standard approach. It may be different uh, in some approaches. Uh, they may require usage of some hardware, uh, hardware secure modules. Uh, in some wallets, uh, the properties of operational system are used, especially on mobiles. Uh, secure enclaves uh, can be used. Uh, regardless of the approach, of course, the wallet needs to be secured, the data needs to be encrypted, uh, the keys should not, you know, some best practices should be applied, uh, should not leave in memory and so on. Uh, as for backup, as for backup, that's also very uh, important uh, thing in SSI because, well, it's a natural question what happens if uh, uh, the holder uh, loses the wallet, right, if the wallet is lost. Uh, what uh, should be done. And uh, of course, one of the approaches there is just to reissue all the credentials. A uh, second approach there is to do some kind of a backup. Uh, there are some techniques uh, which uh, try to kind of link uh, the backup recovery with biometric, with user biometric, and that general access to this wallets can be linked to biometric. Uh, but yeah, there is no just silver bullet. It's 
kind of multiple usual best practices for key management and for wallets. Uh, plus, it can be specific for particular uh, use cases, operational system, environments, profiles, and so on. Awesome. I think we'll take one more question, then we'll jump to uh, maybe take a three-minute break and then get into the demo, Alex. Um, VC presentation has the signature of the holder. This VC presentation can be used by verifiers to misuse this holder to other verifiers. How to basically prevent this type of impersonation as the holder? Yeah. Uh, well, the thing that uh, this usually a new signature created uh, for every new uh, verifier. So it's usually science against some nonce. That's why it's a fresh, new, uh, unique signature, right? Uh, it's one thing. The second thing uh, that, of course, uh, any credential uh, can be used in a malicious way if it's not linked to a biometric. For example, if uh, a father gives access, provides access to his phone to a son, then son can use all the credentials of a father, right? This is. But uh, the usual way to prevent this situation, it's uh, uh, get a leverage in some biometric in addition to just claims. Right, so and it actually applies the same in the case of verifier. If, for example, a photo or some uh, biometric providers are involved in terms of verifying fingerprints, then uh, it's not easy to uh, reuse uh, the same data maliciously. Yeah. So two things: the signature is always the same every time. Plus, usually in many cases, uh, some additional checks are required, uh, such as biometric, to link the actual credential to a particular owner or the holder. Yeah. Um, let's take a three minute break in case anyone needs to use the bathroom and then we're going to get into the demo. I yes, I do see your uh, your question there. We're going to try to get it answered when we start up again in about three or four minutes. So it right now is 10, 103 my time. We'll see everybody at 107. So three minutes, Alex, and we'll get going again. Okay. In case you got to use the bathroom no. or, or get a cup of water or something. Uh, so I hope everyone. Cool. And we're back to recording. I'm going to stop sharing. And Renata, you and Alex, take it away. Great. I understand that the first uh, part was uh, long and productive. Uh, so I hope you have had time uh, to... <laughs> to be a bit free. Uh, so let me share my screen and show you some uh, magic uh, from Credo, not just areas framework JavaScript. Uh, so uh, for start, uh, let me let me share my screen. I'm not sure you see everything. Uh huh. Uh, so, uh, what we are going to, uh, so Renata, we're looking right now at the, uh, demo deck. We're looking at your PowerPoint. PowerPoint? Really? Yes. I'm seeing PowerPoint with demo scenarios. Uh... It is really strange. Well, it's okay. A second. Unusual for Zoom. 
So I try to share the whole screen. Is it successful, Troy? So again, we're seeing... Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can see the whole screen, but uh, the current window is a PowerPoint. Is it PowerPoint, yes, yes, yes. Great, great. Yeah, okay, just, okay. I just wanted to mention what we are going to see. <laughs> you got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, firstly, we want to issue credentials, uh, and uncreate credentials. Uh, through Cardano and uh, checked uh, DID documents. And also we are going to issue um, double through C credentials uh, through checked DID. And also the most interesting point, uh, it is uh, uh, issuing a credential through OpenID connection uh, protocol. Mm, from my point of view, it is a reason why now we don't need to pronounce the whole areas from work JavaScript and just have uh, credit. Because it is not only uh, RS protocols now, but also OpenID Connect. Uh, so let's start and let's uh, start further university like a, an issue and Alice who wants to get a credential from a fabric. Okay. Uh, as a first step, uh, we need to create a peer-to-peer -to -peer connection uh, between uh, Faber and Alice, between issuer and credential and holder. So let's create a link uh, to have an out of band connection. So connection is established. It's been established. Uh, now, on the whole, on the issuer side, let's set up an issuer. Uh, for example, we can create a DID and schema and credential definition for and creates for uh, DID indie. I think it is a common case and most of you already saw this. Uh, so we uh, create a DID schema and credential definition, for example, here in a British Columbia uh, testnet. So we can check this and it will be already on the ledger. So, but we are interested in setting up uh, a checked uh, DID. So, and also schema and credential definition. <laughs> On the demo, it is always something wrong, sorry. Something wrong with connection, sorry, let me try again. Oh, I can tell you about this error while we are waiting. Uh, account sequence, account sequence uh, mismatch. It is an error of using Cosmos SDK uh, CLI. Unfortunately, they have this issue, still have this issue. It is an issue of uh, uh, comparing uh, the current data on the different nodes. So we spend a lot of time trying to fix this. But also recommended us just stop this. So establish the connection. Uh, let's set up an issue. Hope now it should be okay. Oh, sorry. I believe the third time will be okay. So sorry, sorry for this technical issue. Alice went in so many times for her diploma. Uh, so let's cre create a connection. Mm
Let's start with an issue and let's start with Indy. Like an original DID, and during this process, we can create an issue ID. And let's set up chat. Looks like finally we won. Yeah, so uh, we can check this uh, identifier through uh, universal resolver. So we can check that it is already on the ledger. Uh, so, and uh, to check a specific uh, data like schema, we can use the API for dereferencing. Unfortunately, right now, dereferencing doesn't work for universal, universal resolver, but with other tools, I believe it will be available soon. So we see uh, a schema that we created on the ledger. So it is the name of schema uh, and it is the version of schema because schema is an immutable entity. And if you want to uh, create, um, to change something on your credential schema, uh, you need to create a new version. Uh, it is required because uh, if we, in theory, have a possibility to change uh, attributes in the existing schema. Uh, all old uh, issued credentials uh, will be an issue, sorry, uh, because of these uh, changes. Uh, so, and it is the same for credential definition. Credential definition uh, contains uh, a, an issue public key uh, to sign a credential during issuing. So a lot of words, let's start to issue credentials, finally. Let's offer a credential, uh, anonymous credential, uh, and indeed credential uh, through checked uh, DID. So Alice got a credential, got an offer firstly, and secondly accept, accepted it and got a credential. Uh, so it is uh, a name, degree, and date of issuing of uh, this document. So also we have uh, uh, an issue ID here. And so we can see that uh, it is uh, checked DID uh, of this credential. So uh, now let's uh, issue the same type of credential with Cardano DID. Uh, let's set up an issue, this DID Cardano. But in fact, uh, it is uh, uh, DID key, as uh, we know. Uh, so, and uh, we also can check it on the ledger via Universal Resolver. Long pink. While we are waiting, I can show you, for example, uh, Cardano Explorer. So there are our transactions. Let me update it with our DID documents. And uh, for example, uh, and checked Explorer uh, with our last transactions. It is not our last one but there are some that create resources from us. So let me show. Uh, so, and finally, speaking about Cardano, yes, it is resolved. It means that we created a DID key. Uh, we created DID documents uh, by uh, Areas framework, X areas framework JavaScript. And uh, we put this DID documents to Cardano Ledger with this identifier. 
So now let's offer credential. And then create credential with this created DID. So let's accept it from Alice side, from the holder side. And we can see uh, almost the same credential because it is the same uh, uncreate credential type, uh, but with another issuer ID. Now we have another uh, method, and it is a DID that we created and checked right now previously. Uh, during this uh, issue, uh, setting up the, this issue, we created also schema and credential definition in, on Cardano Ledger. So now, when we finished with uh, Anoncreds, uh, let's uh, create, a, let's issue a credential, uh, W3C credential. Let's start with the DID checked. And let's offer this type of credential to Alice. So Alice can see a credential preview that uh, she can accept and get this type of credential uh, with, for example, degree uh, and uh, some description of this document. Uh, so credential received it means that everything is okay. Also, we can offer credit. Mm. Sorry, we can. Oh, we already created this credential. Sorry. Uh, so we also can set up issue for double true C credentials uh, through did key. Uh, like we did it for Cardano. And now we offer a credential, this double through C credential. So we also have the same preview because it is also double through C credential. But here we can see another issue ID with did key method. Let's accept it. And through the ARS protocol, we should receive this credential from the issuer. Uh, so just an overview, uh, we uh, we created uh, four types of um, credentials. In general, first type, it is it was unencrypted uh, with uh, issue based and stored. Uh, in uh, checked ledger and in Cardano ledger. Also, we created two credentials, verifiable credentials uh, of uh, W3C type uh, with uh, DID documents, issue DID uh, from checked ledger and uh, with uh, issue DID uh, from Cardano ledger. Uh, so, and uh, the last uh, oh, sorry. The last item of our demo here. Uh, it is another new demo. Uh, we no, let me clear. Uh, so it is another uh, type of demo. It is another type of protocol. This open ID connection verifiable credential protocol. Uh, it is just um, in progress and implementation right now. We used uh, uh, just a feature branch for this demo. So, but it is, it works and just some preparations are needed. Okay, I believe you remember about Faber and Alice, but now we just have boring issue 
is real. And holder. The logic of uh, issuing a credential here uh, will be the same. Uh, just another protocol. Uh, we don't need to uh, uh, make an additional step here for creating a connection. We just create a credential offer from the start. Uh, but let's say university degree credential. And uh, as for out of band in uh, RS firmware, RS uh, protocol, we just create this one offer and use it for holder. Uh, and now we uh, can see this credential preview. Uh, that's uh, issue offer it to holder. Uh, so here we have uh, formats, uh, GVT, verifiable JSON, to the type of this credential. Uh, so types of uh, credential general. And uh, holder can accept this credential offer, divide which one, and look at the whole credential on the holder side with all signatures and, and, and so on. I want to emphasize here uh, IDID on the credential subject. Uh, and of course, a date through right now. So this credential was created right now by this issue. Uh, you can see that uh, there are different identifiers because in theory for this demo, it may be an identifier of a new identifier of folder, like an example. Uh, so uh, that's it with demo. Uh, do you have any questions? I believe my colleagues helps help with uh, questions in the chat. And I wanted to say thank you for this hot discussion in the chat. It is the first time I remember this, a lot of questions and a lot of answers. Uh, okay. Is there no active questions about demo? I will be happy uh, to uh, continue with the thought part of our event. Uh, so, and I suggest you to code a bit. So I am ready to start from the scratch with you. So here I have a repo. Let me post, <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me post the link. Uh, here you can find a uh, setup script uh, for setting up the whole environment and uh, steps for reproducing demo with uh, indie bezel. Uh, if I speak not too clear and transparent. Uh, so let's start from the first step. Our goal for this uh, workshop uh, Hands-on part uh, is uh, creation a uh, demo uh, for issuing a credential, um, anonymous credential, an uncredited credential, and uh, double three C credential uh, through uh, Creda, Ares framework JavaScript. So let's start from creating a workspace. Oh, whoa, 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 not so fast. Uh, I suggest to use uh, visual codes. And now, while we are waiting for creation, usually it is fast enough. Uh, let me copy this link to chat. Uh, so it is already created. Uh, the first thing that we need to do uh, is uh, set up an, an environment. 
Uh, so here we have a setup script and nothing more to be sure. Uh, we need, uh, we have to use sudo. I understand that it's unpleasant a bit, uh, but we use uh, git port environment and also we have to install some libraries. There's a reason of using uh, sudo here. Uh, so I want to describe uh, what we are going to do with this script. Uh, so firstly, we need to uh, set up in the Bezo uh, ledger. So we clone it and uh, and execute a run script. So here we can see that a lot, a lot of uh, different pages were created. For example, this, this one. Uh, it is Prometheus, as far as I remember, where you can see um, metrics for in the Bezo ledger. Uh, also, there are not this one, one of them anyway. Is Grafana. Uh, so in Grafana, you can uh, look. Uh, on the progress uh, of your ledger, local setup. So I want to open it here. There it is. Let's say instead of big deeper. Uh, so let's open the first dashboard we have for Bezo overview. So here we can see some information uh, about uh, validators. Uh, so uh, after some time here we will have uh, more data about a progress and block time and ledger specific data and metrics. Uh, so, and uh, also we have uh, an explorer. Uh, right now it is in progress, so some data uh, not configured. So let me check. Mm -hmm. I believe it should be somewhere here. If it works, no, sorry. Let's check what it started. Hmm. I even know why. Sorry, uh, it is because we uh, run it without uh, B key. So if you want to have uh, explore on your uh, local uh, setup, um, add here. Uh, this key. Uh, so hope you had enough time to create a workspace and to set up uh, an environment. Also in this script, uh, we uh, created, uh, we clone uh, areas uh, from work repo. Uh, and uh, now let's try to do something with our demo. Uh, so before our workshop, uh, I I have uh, broke uh, broken this uh, demo absolutely to make it possible uh, to uh, code with you uh, the most interesting part of this demo. Uh, so uh, this uh, removed part uh, you can find here in this file uh, demo uh, source. Faber TS. Uh, because it is a file of uh, issuing uh, different types of credential and also uh, the place where we store data, data on the ledger. Uh, so let's start with DID. I hope it was removed here. Because of a lot of red, I believe yes. 
so uh, let me continue with our presentation. Uh, here we, we are going to uh, issue an, an Ancred credential and W3C credential and implement this part where we need to issue a credential. Uh, so the first time that we are going to uh, implement is uh, storing uh, DID documents uh, on the ledger, on the base ledger, what is important. Uh, right now we uh, use uh, Ethereum, DID Ethereum method. Uh, so also we had the ind2 method, but decided to change a logic of implementation here. And so right now uh, we are designing uh, in the Bezel method. Uh, but let's start with Ethereum because it is well-known method and so it is easier to understand what is going on. So let's start with uh, DID creation. I believe here in the code you have We should have a place where creation, uh, where we create a DID uh, document. So the first place it is uh, here, uh, where we uh, create uh, a key firstly. And after this, uh, we have to create a uh, verification method. So let me check one moment for our demonstration. It is about Git history. To be sure that we are on the same uh, on the same branch. So I need to check address from JavaScript, uh, git log. Okay. It is a correct branch, but looks like uh, we can use a more actual branch here. <laughs> so let me check the script. The best in the best demo. Uh, yes, I believe we can use another link here. Uh, so to make it more actual, uh, let's change the tab script to another one. Workspaces. So let me find another one. So this branch, and let me change this link. To make it fast on the GitHub. Okay, now you can pull a new script or just change uh, the branch here to another one. So let me share a new branch alias.
like this for errors from block JavaScript. So, and now let's change branch here for our demonstration. Uh, I'll remove uh, RS framework uh, wrapper to maybe clean up some data to be sure that I have a clean environment. Okay, and set up the script again. Uh, now let's uh, back to Faber script. I don't know why it is right for now. Uh, so, and back to our uh, to creation of uh, uh, DAD documents as we started. So it is here. Uh, currently speaking, it was a change of branch uh, to remove uh, already existing code. So hope uh, everything is okay and you had a chance to change this branch successfully. Uh, so let's continue the, with the code. Uh, now we want to create a DID documents uh, by creating a key throw uh, an agent, putting this key to uh, agent wallet uh, in areas from work JavaScript. And after this, we are going to create a Bezo uh, DID document uh, using specific uh, Bezo, um, Indie Bezo plugin uh, inside areas from work JavaScript uh, using uh, Ethel method and uh, using verification key that we created right now. Um, here is the key that we created here. Uh, so I can just put it, but I understand that it will be too demanding uh, not to share this code with you. So let me share this in the chat. Uh, also, it will be available uh, in presentation. Sorry if it is too rich. Uh, so here we created a DID documents and so on the next steps, uh, we uh, create a schema and credential definition. Uh, but it's uh, in general, uh, it is the same. So let me share, let me show this place of creating a schema. We get to a schema method, uh, create a schema, uh, it is an creates entity uh, on the ladder. And uh, here where you use a specific module, uh, you can register uh, a schema on the ladder. And also in areas from work on areas from work uh, site. Uh, so the same for credential definition. Credential definition we register it uh, inside areas from work, and also uh, on the ladder side. Uh, it is possible not to use uh, verifiable data registry uh, for storing these entities. Uh, but uh, as we discussed it in, in the chat, uh, it is uh, a question of trust. So it is better to store them somewhere to make it possible for checking uh, these entities and this public key uh, on the ledger, like a blockchain distributed um, storage, uh, instead of checking it uh, from the one agency on the sum. Uh, errors from work JavaScript uh, based um, agency or something else. So now when we created uh, 
a DOD document. Ping me if you have any questions right now or troubles on these steps. Hope everything's okay. Uh, so we want to create uh, a credential definition. We want to issue this. So for issue the credential definition, let's visit the next uh, empty place. Uh, here, uh, in the method of issue an incorrect credential, we are going to add some code. So firstly, we have to uh, create a credential. Uh, so still, Alice want to get a diploma with some degree uh, and with some data of uh, finalizing her work at Faber University. Uh, so let's create a credential. Firstly, it is pretty simple. So the most uh, interesting and important place here may be a credential definition identifier. So based on uh, uh, data theorem DID that we created. So, and after creating a credential, we need to offer it to a holder. So let's create an offer. And let me put this code to chat. This for creating a credential. And it is for offer a credential to a holder. And also, uh, the same method, uh, we have to wait uh, Alice answer for this credential. Connection record. I'm not sure why. Usual code doesn't look it right now, but I believe everything will be okay after a yarn installation. Uh, so, and anyway, we can set up yarn installation a bit earlier. So let me stop an environment a bit. So I hope this time was enough uh, to put uh, a code uh, examples uh, to uncreate creation. Uh, and let's continue with uh, uh, JSON OD credential. Uh, so it is uh, W3C protocol. We will use W3C protocol for issuing credentials here. So there are samples, uh, the same in general, because we have to create a credential, but with another fields, with uh, uh, type, because it is a JSON OD credential and we need to follow a strict structure. Uh, but speaking about uh, offer credential, it is almost the same, uh, just uh, with another, another connection record ID because it is a new connection, uh, and theory may be the same. Uh, protocol version, uh, the type of this credential, 
uh, and uh, signature that we are going to use. Uh, and also we have to wait for answer as usual. So let's create a credential uh, here at the start af after getting a connection. Uh, so let's create a credential offer uh, to Alice. Uh, so during this uh, construction, execution of this construction, uh, offer credential will be sent uh, to Alice. And now we are need to wait for answer. So let me post it to the chat. The same three parts. Finally, that's it. Uh, we create a DID document. We uh, issue it. Uh, we implemented uh, credential issuing for uh, ungrades, and we also implemented issuing for W three C credential. Here. So let's try and look. Was it successful? So if you have uh, any questions, please ask. So I will be happy to help you if you have any issues with this coding. Uh, so we need, uh, firstly, uh, what steps were here? Uh, we installed a correct version of Node. And after this, we executed Yarn install uh, to get all libraries that we needed. And now we can start Alice and Faber, as we saw in previous demo. So in general, everything okay is okay, just some troubles with, let's check, maybe a BLS signature, it's okay because it is not included in our demo for now. So let's tap Faber. And also let's start with Alice. So here we can uh, choose what type of credential we are going to issue. And let's start with unencrypted credentials. So firstly, uh, we have to create DID, this code that we implemented uh, to store DID document on the ledger. So let's create DID documents. Let's start with Indy. I feel that is, it is always a good idea. And let's create did ether. So here we created uh, DID documents and put it to uh, did Ethereum, uh, put it uh, like did Ethereum DID method, uh, DID documents uh, to in the Bezel ledger. So we store it on the ledger. Uh, as far as you remember, on previous steps, uh, we uh, set up in the Bezel ledger here, uh, your in setup script. And now we have a connection and can put this document to the ledger. Uh, now let's create a schema code with this so so some troubles let's check maybe some code issue twist okay ledger is available but something is wrong let's start maybe restart it So, and let me check the decoration. Maybe we lost an account after this. Hmm. 
it is a good moment when you can share your emotions and your progress. Do you have the same issue with ledger connection or no? Yeah, I think uh, the error that sender account not authorized to send transactions are probably something the role uh, signed to the sender. Uh, yes, it might be the role issue, but uh, we changed uh, permission on the ledger uh, for this demo uh, to allow everyone to write. So maybe let's check this moment in setup script. So it looks like it was something wrong with my last commit, sorry. Uh, let's change this branch, mm, which should help, I believe. Because here should be, uh, the branch should be okay, but let's try another branch. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, so let's try to change setup script. So I believe we have to use, firstly, let's uh, stop uh, the current ledger. Because remember, I deployed it with uh, Explorer last time. So. Uh, let's first start with the ledger part. Uh, for this, we need to visit. Mm -hmm. It is the error, I believe I saw. It is really a wrong branch. Andy node. Andy bezel. Because we, uh, last time, uh, we changed network scripts. Uh, we change a repo for Indie Bezel because firstly we deployed it to Indie Node, and right now we have a separate uh, repo on GitHub uh, in Hyperledger Indie Project, uh, but with a new code. So, let's stop it and remove. Successful. Anyway, let's remove it. Let's try from another place. Because we started it from the um, root uh, directory, so suggest to use that caches. So, and now let's remove this data. Okay. Uh, so I suggest to change a uh, branch to a new one. Uh, let me open it in a new window. So a new repo replaced in Hyperledger is here. And the correct branch should also here. It is a new branch that you can check out for the ledger part. And let's use it for our code.
Oh, sorry, we didn't remove uh, weapon. Mm -hmm. And let's tap on your version of our code. So give me a second. So while we are waiting, let's check Explore for now. It is still in progress, I believe. Uh, we need some time to, uh, to set up and explore here. Oh, this port. Okay, anyway, uh, let's uh, back to our demo. Oh, it is Explorer where you can see, uh, for example, transactions. The list is empty right now uh, because we didn't uh, create any DID documents. Uh, and uh, resources, let's do it right now. Let's restart Alice and let's start Faber. So by uh, different steps, uh, it is the same demo that we saw. And here on slides, if you want to try it after this call, uh, there are steps that you need to execute to issue a credential. Let's try again with a new ledger. And let's get your schema. Okay, now it was successful. And uh, it was a good point where we can uh, we could uh, see that uh, without a good connection with the ledger, we can't create uh, a schema. Uh, now it is creation created, and now we have to create a credential definition uh, also on the ledger. So by some time, uh, transaction uh, will be loaded. Uh, so and we will see new transactions here. Uh, so we created a credential definition on the ledger, and now we have uh, to uh, issue a credential. For this, uh, let's let's make it comfortable, and uh, let's create a, a connection uh, between Faber and Alice. We created a connection invitation like in the previous demo. Uh, 
uh, so connection established and now we have to uh, offer a credential and request credential for Alice. Alice uh, received a credential uh, offer and can see uh, what is inside this offer, inside this credential and accept credential. So uh, let's go to credential. And now we can uh, request a proof for this credential. Whoa, we lost status, sorry. I did it too fast. So anyway, while we're waiting for Alice, um, it is already here, we can uh, create a new connection. Important moment when when why it was broken last time. If you push uh, push uh, enter too fast, uh, you can broke a menu by uh, putting exit exit here. Uh, just uh, choosing this too fast. Uh, so we have connection. Let's issue a credential and check it. Offer credential. Accept credential. So, credential is created, the whole list of signatures. And now let's uh, request a proof. So there is only one credential for, it means that we request this proof. And now Alice can provide and create a proof uh, for this credential. So this is this one, we see proof and create a proof. Uh, proof is requested, uh, proof presented. So we can see that everything, everything is okay and we have a relevant uh, data of Alice uh, credential. Okay, let's try to restart it and try another type of credential. Uh, let me remember that Uh, previously, we uh, created, we implemented the part of creating double through C credential. Uh, so let's also create a connection. Uh, let's create a DID. So here we can create different types of DID, like for the previous demo. And let's create data theorem. Uh, so here we also create uh, data on the ledger site um, and create uh, DID documents on in the bezel that are launched right now. Uh, so we created a DID and can offer credential. Alice received this credential. You see that it is a bit bigger uh, because of formats uh, that we describe here, uh, like a JSON LD credential. Uh, here, just JSON credential, uh, but here you can see uh, specification links and others that are specific for LD credentials. Also, it may be used. Uh, so, and uh, date of signature and overview of this credential here and uh, Alice can accept this credential and uh, order will uh, receive information that credential accepted from Alice site. Uh, so that's it. Uh, let me show what we implemented right now. Mm, we uh, created a DID document on the ledger. Uh, we uh, 
implemented a part of creating a credential uh, of uncred type. And also, uh, we implement, implemented part of creating uh, a credential and offer this and issue by double through C type. This type of credential uh, using in the Bezel ledger. Uh, it is uh, on the face of POC, and we are implementing MVP right now. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it is already available, and we will be happy for any interest, questions, uh, and, and of course, help with the uh, Indie Bezel project. So that's it. Thank you. Sorry it was, if it was too long. I will be happy to answer for your questions. So uh, Shibu asks, thanks, got it. So when we try the demo, do we check out IndieBezo demo using did Etherbranch? Was I muted? No, I wasn't. Uh, Renata, did you hear that question? Uh, sorry, I see that. There's a question in chat. Yeah, yeah the question That's in chat. There's a question in chat. Yeah, so when we try the demo, do we check out IndieBezu demo using did either branch? Yes, it is a correct branch. Uh, sorry for a small mistake in the setup script. Uh, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, uh, it was uh, uh, the previous link was uh, to the oldest version uh, where we uh, blocked uh, all uh, unknown transactions here in the on this branch. Uh, we have uh, uh, open uh, role map where everyone can push uh, uh, their transaction. So let me uh, push and use setup script uh, to fix this confusion. So are there are any questions? Ooh, any other questions in chat? Uh, Alex and Artem were uh, diving in on questions as they came in, so we may not have any, but we'll give folks another couple of seconds. If they do have a question they'd like to ask Renata based on the demo, please feel free. Uh, Farouz asked in chat, can we use NoSQL SQL databases as a non-creds VDR? If it's possible, then what steps would be followed to implement that custom VDR? Mm, that's a good question. So, uh... In general, it is already here because uh, if we speak about uh, Freda, uh, areas from Rob JavaScript X, uh, it is already have uh, no, as far as I remember, no SQL database where you can store uh, a DID wallet, firstly, uh, and uh, DID public key of issue, credential definition, uh, schema, and so on for different types of credentials. Uh, and credits too. Uh, so, and so it's possible to use uh, this storage. And also it is possible to change not by plugins, but uh, change the storage inside Ares Framework JavaScript. So yes, of course it's possible to already in Ares Framework JavaScript. Yeah, I'd also yeah. like to add that uh, basically is Ledger, Hyperledger, uh, Uncreds is Ledger agnostic. So it means there is a kind of an interface to implement for this registry for the VDR. And you know that this implementation of the interface can be anything. It can be IndieBazu, it can be Cardano, it can be checked, any other blockchain, or it can be something in memory or a database. So it's uh, right now one of the advantages of uh, Hyperledger Anuncrat's uh, specification and implementation that it's really ledger agnostic and uh, you can have any implementation uh, that are suitable for particular cases in terms of trust uh, for a VDR. Awesome, thank you, Renata and Alex for, for that answer. Any other questions, please put it in chat. Um, we don't wanna leave your questions out, although Artem and, and Alexander are doing a fantastic job knocking them down in chat. Um, but we want to give everybody a chance. They do have a question before we jump over to the next part of our workshop. All right, back to Alexander and Renata. 
Oh, here. Oh, uh, no, we just answered that question. Thanks, Farouz. Well, so uh, if there are no other questions, then thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the uh, session. It was a pretty long uh, uh, workshop and lots of different uh, terms and uh, theory, as well as the lots of demo and code. Uh, I hope it was interesting and you found something new that's something new uh if you have any questions of course feel free to reach us in uh discord uh, as part of our community calls uh and linkedin and yeah thank you everyone Julian. Yeah. and thank you everybody um couple things to note uh the deck slides that alexander presented earlier are on the wiki page i just posted in uh in chat the video, when it finishes encoding, will be embedded on that page. It's also on the Hyperledger uh, YouTube channel. Um, the Gitpod URL is on the wiki page in case you want to go through the hands-on part of the workshop again on your own time with the video running in the background. Not a problem. Um, we're going to keep that up for a couple of days at least. And... Uh, I am going to send out a thank you note early next week to everyone who registered uh, for the workshop. It's going to include all the links. Uh, it's going to include um, information like when the different community calls are happening for Bezu, for Anoncreds, for Aries, for Credo. Um, it's also going to include uh, a quick note. If you want to share back with us your experience of working with Gitpod and let us know how you felt about it, from a hands-on perspective um, of being in a workshop. We would love to hear feedback on that. This was an experiment for Hyperledger to see if we could have more interactive workshops. And I'm hoping that uh, if this doesn't work out, we can try another product, but I'm hoping to, we wanna have more interactive workshops where folks aren't just watching demos, but they're able to get their hands dirty in the code. So once again, I would like to thank Artem, Renata and Alexander for putting on such a fantastic, and, and DSR, for putting on such a fantastic workshop. We really appreciate it. Um, and by all means, join us on Discord, join us on a mailing list. Um, you can check out what we're doing on the uh, Hyperledger YouTube. We have a channel for workshops. We have, I'm sorry, we have a playlist for workshops. We have a playlist for decentralized identity. All of our community calls are put up there and we would love to see you. And uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to help. And if you'd like to start using these, these tools and products, we would love to see you do that. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you all for attending and I'm going to end this workshop. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate all the questions and interaction from uh, the attendees. Thank you very much. Let's give everybody a second. In case thank you. Thank you, Lord.